Cześć, tutaj Tomek Kopyra z blogu blogkopyra.com. Zaczynamy transmisję. Idzie na internecie konferencyjnym, który teoretycznie jest super, ale jak 100 osób zacznie z niego korzystać, to nie wiem jak będzie. Eee, pobrałem już becz. Eee, mam taki zamiar, żeby transmitować całość, jeśli będzie taka, e, taka możliwość. Eee, przełączyłem teraz kamerę, bo mikrofon jest coś w tą stronę ustawiony. Dajcie znać w komentarzu, czy, czy jakoś jest zadowalająca, czy, czy dźwięk jest dobry i tak dalej. Mam nadzieję, że mikrofon będzie dobrze zbierał dźwięk z, e, ze speechu, no ale nie wiem. Eee, także nie spodziewajcie się raczej jakiejś mojej dużej interakcji. Raczej e, będzie tak, że będę po prostu transmitował to, co się dzieje na scenie. Na scenie Wczoraj, wczoraj, wczoraj było bardzo fajne party, pokojnie z blogerem, bardzo serdecznego zresztą Haka, gdzie testowaliśmy polskie, polskie, polskie piwa. Generalnie były, były bardzo duże wrażenie. Najbardziej smakowało, najbardziej smakowało wszystkim ja co prawda nie zapisałem się do drugiej wersji, nie do drugiej wersji, ale jeśli będą jeszcze miejsca, to prawdopodobnie, prawdopodobnie się dopiszę. Nie wiem, czy jak mówię w tą stronę, to mnie słychać, czy nie. W sumie ja mogę się przełączyć na tą kamerę. Może mikrofon. Na razie wyłączę to, to mikrofon. E, więc piwo z Loży Jeża zrobiło robotę. E, niektórym też bardzo smakował e, Octavio, e, czyli e, quadrupel z browaru Jana. Byliśmy w fajnym miejscu wczoraj wieczorem. E, nazywa się... E, a Life Brew Farm. To jest tak jakby w strefie ekonomicznej zrobić, ktoś pomyślał, hej, tu można dostać jakieś tam ulgi, jakieś dofinansowanie, zróbmy tutaj takie miejsce, żeby ludzie przyjeżdżali i imprezowali. No i zrobili. Godzinę, żeśmy jechali, no normalnie bez korków jest pół godziny z, tutaj z okolic Waszyngtonu. Mają tam browar, mają winiarnię, mają salę taką, czy taką scenę koncertową. Za 10 minut się zaczyna konferencja. W tym, w... no byli zaskoczeni na przykład na Chmieloną. Pierwszy raz niektórzy próbowali. Nie wszystkim smakowała, ale... Co jeszcze? No, Imperium Prunum też zrobiło duże wrażenie. Hi. Hi, I'm Rick. I'm Tomasz. Tomasz. Where are you from? Midwest, Ohio, Michigan. Hi, 
Chicago is Chicago is second the biggest port city in the world. Yes, <laughs> yes. We, 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 we yeah, we, we, we are live for you. And live, huh? we are going, I'm going to uh, live stream whole conference. There is rig, there is can. How are you doing? Ask him what he has in there. <laughs> When did you get in? Uh, when? Yeah. Did you get in? Have you been here all week? You went to yeah, I, I, yeah, I've been in Dog Fish and Guinness. Uh, I, I come here uh, Monday. Okay. Very nice. Cool. Well, you're going to love Virginia beer. I hope so. Uh, yesterday, for example, uh, two was very, or maybe three beers at the, at the party were really good. I, I like the Imperial Stout, Belgian IPA, and uh, Berliner Vice. Uh, uh, two silos. And, uh, two silos, okay, yeah. And uh, farm, farm brewery or something like that. The farm. Right, right. So two silos is uh, like farm brew live out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were so there at the, at the party. The it's strange. It looks like someone is think, okay, there is a facility where we can support entrepreneurs, yeah? Right. Let's do this to make a party, yeah? Right. <laughs> because it's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it is now, it won't be always be. This, the, all the population is moving that direction. But what's amazing about that place is you have live music, yeah. the restaurant, and in the winter time, they uh, have you rip the great it, igloos. It, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit like, it's a bit oh. like, you know, Disneyland for, for others, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> For the beer lovers, and, uh, for beer lovers. For beer lovers yeah. Yeah. Oh, wine lovers, yeah. yeah. Okay, przełączamy na ten, bo już powoli... Uh, a, jeszcze 7 minut. Jak to jak? A chłopak, a chłopak tej Barbie jak ma na imię? Popularne imię. Tak wygląda mikrofon, nigdy go nie pokazywałem. W sumie tego mogę ściągnąć, bo tutaj nie ma wiatru. Video mic me. Robę. Będzie mi mniej tutaj zasłaniał. Powerbank przygotowany. Także mam nadzieję, że będzie dobrze. Dajcie łapki w górę, to, to może YouTube będzie polecał tę konferencję. Nie, ja nie będę miał spicza. Nie zapisywałem się. Nie no, stwierdziłem, że bez przesady. Yy, yy, pewnie bym coś tam mógł powiedzieć, ale, ale nie, nie. Przyjechałem tutaj jako szary użytkownik, ale jak będzie jakaś dyskusja, to nie, nie, nie zawaham się wziąć w niej udział. Na tym, tym widzicie sponsorów. Jest Dogfish, jest Guinness, Devil's Backbone, Rogue, z tych znanych bardziej e, e, browarów. Wczoraj spotkałem, wczoraj spotkałem jedną blogerkę, taką panią gdzieś 60 plus. No i ona podchodzi i mówi, a ty jesteś z Polski, bo ja jestem Polką tak naprawdę. Oczywiście nic nie mówi po polsku, mieszka w Stanach, ale jej, jej rodzice z obu stron no, byli z Polski po prostu. Nie? E, także fajnie, fajnie. E, w, w tym. W Dokfiszu też się okazało, że jeden z gości, którzy tam pracują, ma polskie korzenie, chyba towar. Także no, jest tutaj sporo tych, e, tych takich polskich akcentów. No i piwo, piwo bardzo smakowało wczoraj. Czy tyskie jest? Eee, nie, nie, nie widziałem. Tam jest hak, który nas wczoraj gościł. W pokoju. Bardzo, mega sympatyczny koleś. I się cieszę, że nas gościł, bo ja chciałem zaprosić ludzi do siebie do pokoju, ale e, party po prostu e, eskalowało, bo e, w pewnym momencie chyba było ze 30 osób w tym pokoju. 
głośno jak na przerwie w szkole podstawowej. Myślałem, że będą jakieś dymy. Ale o 12 wszyscy grzecznie się rozeszli. Zostało jakieś 100 butelek. Może nie, ale z 40 to na pewno. Bo oni też poprzywozili coś tam, każdy ze, swojej, ze, ze swojego stanu. Po południu, po południu ma mieć speech, jak się nazywa, samka John z, z Dokwisza o tym, jak urósł od e, praktycznie domowej warzelenki do jednego z top 20 browarów e, e, w, ty, w, w Stanach. Słuchajcie, czy jakoś jest dużo lepsza niż zwykle, czy jest tak sobie, czy, czy tak jak zwykle? Bo teoretycznie tutaj ten internet jest, jest bardzo mocny, nie? Bo tam mi pokazywało jakiś upload, jakieś 50 mega, aczkolwiek ping był słaby. No to fajnie, to się cieszę, bo z LTE bym tutaj nie pochulał, bo jest po prostu za grube mury są. Dużo lepiej niż zwykle, no to fajnie, to się cieszę. Już powoli zaczynam być tutaj e, kojarzony z tymi livestreamami. Czemu lustrzane odbicie? Też chciałbym to wiedzieć, Stefan. Po prostu w YouTubie ktoś pomyślał, że jeżeli na Instagramie jest lustrzane odbicie i na Snapchacie, to też zróbmy lustrzane odbicie. Po co? Nie wiem. No nie, nie wyrzucili nas z hotelu. Mówię właśnie, że party było takie... Ale nie, wszystko kulturka, nie? Wszystko kulturka, wszyscy wyszli o własnych siłach. Nikt nie... Dobrze, że chociaż nie było haftu, prawie żebym wyżonął ducha kraftu. No niestety, też mnie to wkurza, bo kiedyś było dobrze, kiedyś nie było tego lustrzanego odbicia, a teraz jest. Ale jak przełączymy się na główną kamerę, to nie będzie już lustrzanego odbicia, więc spoko. In Dear Bloggers and Writers Conference. How is that Good? Yeah, it's good. My name is Reno, and uh, I'm here with Brian Newhouse and Sarah Fletcher, and uh, I represent Zephyr Conferences, and we 
host the Beer Bloggers and Writers Conference, and we've done this for nine years. This is the ninth annual Beer Bloggers and Writers Conference. Thank you uh, for making this happen for so long. Uh, Zephyr Conferences uh, started 10 years ago. We started the world's first blogger conference. It was the Wine Bloggers Conference. And now we run the Wine Bloggers Conference, the Wine Marketing and Tourism Conference, the Beer Marketing and Tourism Conference, which, by the way, who has been to the Beer Marketing and Tourism Conference? It's a pretty cool event. It's an industry event. You should think about going if you haven't. Um, and also the International Food Bloggers Conference. Uh, we also run active food, wine, and beer vacations around the world, and we've done that for 21 years. And we do that as separate adventures and as taste vacations. So um, if you need a vacation, go on one of those tours. Um, there are 135 beer influencers uh, and industry representatives in the room here today. Uh, so thanks for coming. Uh, you come from 35 different states, including Poland. Thomas, he's with the Beer, beer Guide at PL, um, and he can teach us a lot. Um, Paul Bailey from the UK, from Paul's Beer and Travel Guide. Paul, are you here yet? He's not. He's on his way. I think he's in DC negotiating tariffs on cask ales. <laughs> uh, Tiffany Martin of the Traveling Pint, Pint from Ontario. <laughs> Tiffany! Yeah. And Brooke Christie. Uh, Brooke Christie, are you in the room? All right. Canadians. She's from Ontario. She's representing the Lake of the Woods Brewing Company. She's here to network and learn more about social media marketing. I sat next to her on the bus. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And of course we have um, our sponsors. And this conference wouldn't be possible without the sponsors. Um, I'm going to list them off. Devil's Backbone. They've sponsored this conference for years. Uh, Rogue. I believe they've sponsored all but one of these conferences. Killfrost has been sponsoring our conferences for several years now. Virginia Tech. West Virginia's Blue Ridge, a great destination here in Virginia. Craftbeer.com and the Brewers Association have sponsored this conference every year. Great to be working with them. Visit Richmond. Who's going on the Richmond excursion? Awesome. Uh, Guinness. Who went on the Guinness excursion? Great. Yeah. Many years ago, we went to Guinness uh, in Ireland. Um, for our, Euro our European Beer Bloggers Conference. Uh, so we've worked with them in the past. Of course, Dogfish Hit. Who went on that excursion? Yeah. Who went swimming in the ocean? That <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, the National Beer Wholesalers Association, the NBWA. They've sponsored this conference and, and informed us well for many years. Uh, Prince William County. Many of us went there last night. That was a, a unique and fantastic experience. Virginia's Craft Beer Brewers Guild, and of course, Visit Loudoun. Um, this conference will be possible. Yeah. Did you already applaud for yourselves? Let's do it if you stick with This year, we've listed all the sponsors on the back of your badge, as well as their accounts. Um, and we've done that so that it's easier for you to show the love. Uh, and that's why the sponsors are here. They're here for love. If you like what they do, um, then let the world know because you're beer influencers and there's people that are listening and if you say hey this product's awesome uh, sponsors will really appreciate that and so will your followers um, and if you like this conference let the world know please anytime you're using social media or even writing a blog post or publishing an article in the paper use that BBC 18 hashtag or at least let them know you're at the beer bloggers and writers conference if you like here if you like what the speakers are saying let the world know, hey, these, these guys are smart. They just taught me this, BBC 18, uh, and whatever their account is. Um, because again, people are listening, so use your influence, blog posts, tweets, live streams, smoke signals, uh, whatever it is, do it and let the world know. Um, wouldn't it be cool if this conference trended? We've done it in the past, it was many years ago, uh, before Twitter was maybe taken over by politics and other things, uh, we were able to trend with beer. Uh, but I think we can do it. Uh, we are in D.C. where I think we're or close to D.C. anyway, so maybe we can do it again this time. So, uh, And we're going to try to give you more time to do that and more tools to do that with, such as this. And we're going to put more lists on the tables, with hashtags, and so on and so forth. So please get out there on social media. All right, um, a few things. Before you can do the social media, you need to be on Wi-Fi. Um, who's on the Wi-Fi already? Great. Anybody having any issues with the Wi-Fi? 
Okay, great. So it's HH honors and then login or the uh, the password. Put the beers on your table and open them for you, and then of course you can enjoy the pleasure of pouring the beer into your beer glass for sessions. Uh, you can't take open containers out of this room, um, and we will let you know and inform you on other rules throughout the conference, but uh, those are some of the rules. I know in the past we've been able to drink our own beers in this room, and even some people will be drinking right now, but we're not doing that this year because of the rules, but that's okay. Uh, the bathrooms are in the hall, just outside here, and take a right. Uh, please keep your name badges on at all times, including when you go on the excursions, including when you go on the Richmond excursion. I wanted to connect the microphone, and I'm going to be on time. And we, the only way we can do that is if you're all on time, so I really appreciate that. Yeah, no um, and now I want to introduce somebody who is very important, um, the reason why we're here. Again, visit Loudoun. Um, great destination. We ask a lot of locations every year if we can bring this conference to their region. Um, and not all of them respond, and some say no, and some of them say yeah, but. Ale walczyć z tym dźwiękiem? Bo mogę teoretycznie zakończyć tą e, transmisję i uruchomić nową. Powinno już być dobrze. Czy da się słyszeć? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? I, I will say that there's a couple of things that I just want to start off. Number one, I am a huge craft beer lover. And I will tell you, there's a little bit of I love that, thank you very much. But I will tell you as much as I am a very big craft beer lover, and I certainly appreciate the, the, the nod for uh, the reason that we're here, I will tell you that the reason that you're here is because of Jackie Saunders, who is on our team, VP of Marketing in the back. And she and let me know how she does. But actually, Logan is an absolute hoot. We're thrilled to have her on the team. So I want to tell you just a little bit about Loudoun County as a destination and why you're here. Um, first of all, I will tell you that for many years, we have been branded DC's wine country. We have more acres under vine than anywhere else in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We have 50 wineries um, and tasting rooms. But you know what it takes to make good wine? Beer. It takes great beer and a lot of it. So to watch the explosion of the craft beer industry in Loudoun County as a, and shh, not tell anybody, I actually don't drink wine. So when they started, to, when, I, when I started with the job, Jackie and her team gave me a cheat sheet of all sorts of things to talk about varietals. So that when I talk to people like you, I sound as if I know what I'm doing. And so when I started to watch the craft beer movement go, and really, really go, I'm like, this is good, because this is something that I can do. So last year, when um, I think that we talked about this conference coming to Loudoun County, we had 22 craft breweries. Now we have 32 craft breweries. Not only do we have the distinction of having the most acres under vine in Loudoun County, we also have the most breweries in Loudoun County. Add on that, we've got two distilleries, two cideries. It is clear that in Loudoun County, we like our drinking. We like our hooch. And as I look around the room, I will tell you this is also the type of conference where I go, I am underdressed. I see these fantastic shirts all the way around. So when you have an opportunity, please make sure that you bring home a little bit of Loudoun County when you go. So I'm going to ask real quickly, how many of you have been to a Loudoun County brewery? Damn. Shout out your favorites. Tell me where you've been. Crooked Spanish, Crooked Spanish. 
I, I used to babysit Jake, actually. From Rocket Rock. Okay, I'm sorry, who else over here? I heard Joy. Rocket Frog. Who said Rocket Frog? Damn, look at you. Rocket Frog just opened up as we're cutting in. What did you say? Rocket Frog, fantastic. Okay, so let me just go through. Did you guys all go to Rocket Frog now that I say that? Perfect. I'm embarrassed, but that's okay. So I think that you guys have got, outside of my job, probably the best job, which is to talk about craft beer. And what's got to also be a challenge, not only do you get to drink a lot of craft beer, but apparently there's some serious rules in the Commonwealth of Virginia. That was a pretty funny way to start a conference. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this, you cannot do this. Drink lots of water and the bathrooms are right there. That's when you know that you're at a beer bloggers conference. But I think one of the challenges, I would imagine, for you is creating that unique story. Every destination has got great beer. We've got, you, you had an opportunity to go to our neighbor, Prince William County, Dan in the back. Last night, they certainly have got great beer. So every destination has great beer. When you go to Richmond, you guys are in for a treat. Outside of uh, this immediate region, they have got some of the most kick-ass breweries down there. Um, so I think you guys are in for a great, great, great adventure. But when you guys have an opportunity to talk about what's unique about Loudoun County, I just want to leave you with a couple of quick thoughts. Number one, in case somebody hasn't told you, 70% of the world's internet traffic comes through Loudoun County, Virginia. So when you start looking at who, besides winemakers, drink a lot of craft beer, the technology industry. So when you start looking at breweries that really are that quality of life in a destination, the place that makes that place a little bit more unique, craft breweries are a really important part of our technology industry. And actually, a lot of people have left the technology industry to open some of our breweries. So that's a great story. The other story I want to tell you a little bit about, you're going to see it today, is Vantage. So when we have, when you talk about wine, and for years people talk about drinking from the land, right? That's why you go to wineries, because you have that opportunity to taste what's a little bit different in that wine and in that glass. Vanish is the only place in the Mid-Atlantic where you're going to have that opportunity. They have their hops processing facility there, so they are brewing with hops that are processed on the land. They've got a malting facility, so they are using grains that are malted on the land. Grains that are grown, by the way, in Loudoun County, which is helping us keep our agricultural story alive. They've got, of course, the, the well water there, which is another great component, so their water is unique to their land. And then about the yeast, I'm assuming they're growing the yeast, I don't know. So I'm going to say they're growing their yeast. But, so again, I think you're going to get the closest to drinking from the land that you can anywhere else today at Vantage, so I'm really excited about that. And part of the story they're going to tell you is the infrastructure and the investment that came all the way from our governor down to our local economic development offices, people that really identify and recognize the importance of what you do in this room in helping us tell our story. So I think the last thing I just want to leave you with is um, talking just a moment about the local ale trail. I mentioned Jackie um, that helped us to develop that and launch it. So that gives you an idea. I don't know how anybody can see all of this, right? I know you've got a, a pocket version of it. But let me just break it down a little bit on the back. So Loudoun County is a very large county. So you have on the eastern side a very urban setting. So we've got breweries that are in an urban setting field. They're in industrial parks. They've got brick interiors. They've got all the great industrial looks and feels um, that people are looking for in an industrial and an urban brewery. And they're doing some great product. Then we also have got farm breweries. And you're going to see some of those today. So the farm brewery product, again, is a really important one in Loudoun County. It's because of our farm breweries that really are keeping that western part of Loudoun County in agricultural use. So again, that's another important story. The role of agriculture in making great craft beer you'll see here in Loudoun County. So we also have in between the rural west and the urban east, we've got these wonderful historic downtowns that have got a lot of breweries inside of them. And the thing that I think is so important when we talk about this industry, not only the fact that we love the, the product, this is the frontier of entrepreneurship and small businesses. And it's important to tell their stories. So uh, we also have, we go through and talk about that we've got um, breweries that you can reach by bike trail. You can ride all the way from the WNOD, which starts in Loudoun County. You can ride all the way to DC. 
And along the line, he had some great breweries. So another great storyline if you want to pull that one. So I, I encourage you to enjoy. If you have any questions, please speak with Jackie. Or, of course, challenge Logan and see how she does. Um, but I am also here at your disposal. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you here. And I am so excited that you're here and that you get to enjoy some of what is the absolute best in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and that is Loudoun County beer. So remember, Loco Ale Trail, hashtag Loco Ale Trail, hashtag Love Loudoun. And make sure that you say whatever it was that you were doing on, on, on Twitter, trend that Beth Erickson loves her craft beer and is the best speaker you will hear today. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Again, good morning, and I'm going to echo what Reno said. Welcome to the 2018 Beer Blogs and Writers Conference. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Ryan Newhouse, uh, Marketing Director, uh, but some of you I've met uh, in the last few years because I've also been an attendee for the conference. So uh, it is my pleasure, and I got to know and swim with some of you as well uh, at the pre-con excursion, so I'm very grateful for that uh, experience. Was, uh, that we've had over the last couple of days. And I also get to introduce our very first presentation. You know, with, with craft beer, to me, craft beer is three things. Craft beer is community, right? Uh, craft beer is commitment, and craft beer is creativity. So, we get to be now with somebody who uh, is part and has been part of our community since day one. And we're grateful for that. And if you uh, have gotten to hear this uh, opening presentation speaker before, you'll know that uh, she is committed to providing you all with the data and the information and the inspiration to keep doing and do your best work year after year after year. And what she will certainly do is create a lot of energy uh, to get this conference started in the, in the very best way. So if you would welcome the Craft Beer Program Director, my friend and our friend, Julia Hurries.
Um, so we are a voice for small and independent craft brewers um, at the National Association. We have more than 50,000 members, not just breweries, but not just home brewers, retailers, wholesalers, um, and the like. So it's a really uh, a diverse universe that we work at as a national organization. It's, the breweries are who we represent first and foremost, but without those stakeholders, including you guys, the media tier, um, we don't have a full community. So I often recognize that when I'm speaking. And what's important too is that we're a membership-driven organization. These are our current 19 chair of board of directors. You guys might recognize some faces. Kind of faces are kind of fun to pick who's who. This fine person in the middle will be speaking next. Julie Barati from Denizens in the back um, is not only a giver to her state, to her brewery, to her community, she gives to the craft brewers too. And she is now on our board. And what an incredible thing we're going to have is we're finally having a devoted diversity discussion right after me. So I'm super jazzed about that. Now, let's talk big picture for beer. Oh my god, slide, slide through these slides, because you guys know the story. Prohibition ends. What a happy day. Look at those happy people in that happy picture about Prohibition. Ends at last, 1933. Let's zoom forward, 1985, your dismal era in beer. Starting to emerge again, starting to see signs of life. But look how many breweries, how few breweries we in the Journal of the, New, the, Journal of the Brewers Association called The New Brewer. We published that every other month for decades now. That's how many breweries we were able to, we were able to document in the United States in 1985. Then I flip forward, I'd like to show this one. 2005, good God, Ad Age, could you put any works of a, deadline, of a, hard, uh, a headline on the death of beer? Like, Ad Age, come on, help us out here. Literally, there's nothing intriguing about beer. It's like water and soft drinks, and it's advertised like water and soft drinks. Now, as much as I can pick a bone with this, they kind of had a point. An American, mass-produced American lager, really was taking beer to a place that was just about a few specific things, but it wasn't broad enough. Then after that era, what do we have? Today, we are now the number one destination for beer on planet Earth. I showed the slide a lot. Finally have a nice little world graphic though to really bring it home. Why are we? Because we have the craft beer movement, because we have small and independent craft breweries, and because we have that local brew pub, gastro pub, microbrewery, and regional craft breweries that said, hey Big Beer, we're going to show you what to do, and now Big Beer is in that space too, and beer is advancing, and it's a beautiful thing. So, we love it. We love beer. This is a picture from Great American Beer Festival. And yeehaw. Just wanted to show that. <laughs> Let's talk about sales. I show this slide every um, conference, but we always update it. So if you've seen this before, this is new numbers. I make the point that we are not only the number one destination for beer on planet Earth, but we are a beer-loving nation first and foremost based on sales. $111 billion for beer. Compared to wine, $62 billion? Come on. We have people. United States adults that love beer more than other beverages. It's a fact. Let's look at this. Gallup comes out. This just came out at the end of July. Right updated. Grabbed it from their website. A little hard to read, but I'll talk you through it. What's going on here is that we, when asked, do you most often drink liquor, wine, or beer? Because we know we all, some of us drink, Sam brought up the cross-drinking concept that some of us drink all three beverage categories. Actually, two-thirds of us do. Um, but most often would be beer, and beer went up from 2017 to 2018 to 42% was the answer, compared to 34% for wine, and spirits went down from 2017 to 26% to 19%. Wow. Also, what's this dismal little box there where beer took a dip and wine went up? I'm going to blame it on the ad age article. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, Here's some uh, historic barrel right? This is 1988 to 2017. And don't worry about all the numbers, you guys. If I cruise things too fast, you'll get the deck after. But the gist of this is, is the change in beer, right? Domestic, mass domestic swaps 41 million barrels of beer from 1988 to 2017. Imports, by the way, are a big part of this beer story. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. 
But craft brewers came from nothing to something, right? Before we even had this craft brewing movement, before brew pubs were on the map, we didn't even have that category. And now that category is one in eight um, beers sold and one in four dollars for the United States is from craft brewers. Incredible story. Here's how to frame it. The big two, Anheuser-Busch InBev and Walser Coors, responsible for 67% of the volume of beer sold. We've got imports at 17% and craft brewers. So let me frame it. There's more than 6,600 breweries in the United States today. 98% are craft brewers. But yet they only have less than 13% of the beer share by volume. So something's off. And when you hear the Brewers Association advocating for the beverage of beer and advocating for breweries, we're going to bring that story up again and again. Something is off when 98% of the breweries only have less than 13% of the beer share by volume. So you've got some tension going on in the beverage of beer, and it's important to note. What I, number one, would love to start to see is that craft brewers get close to what's imported. Let's get it there. Let's get a little more marketplace balance. That is very important in all those dollars stay in the United States, and that's a great place to start. So this um, puts it in perspective on size of brewery. Size of brewery often comes up. Craft brewers are less than 6 million barrels of beer a year. Uh, Samuel Adams, Boston Beer come up a lot. They're not even the most advanced producing craft brewer. They're on the far left of that slide. It's actually Yinling, um, which is more advanced producing, 2.7 million barrels. But then you jump up to put it in perspective. Heineken USA, including their Lagunitas barrels, is at 8.1 million barrels of beer a year, right? You got Constellation, 19 million barrels of beer a year. That's a lot of Corona people. Ballast Point is a couple hundred thousand barrels of Constellation's brands, mostly Corona. That yellow is the collective of small and independent, that almost 25 million barrels of beer a year. Um, imports are talked about, but it's more than craft brewers. I'd love to see those even out. And then you have Molson Coors at 52 million barrels of beer a year. That's a little different than 6 million or less. And then you've got Anheuser-Busch InBev with their collective acquired breweries, and they're at 89 million barrels of beer a year. And globally, you've got 500 million plus for ABI. Incredible story, incredible amount of volume of beer. And then I always talk about the personalities of beer. There are different personalities within the beverage category to me of beer. Small and independents for draft. Look at the difference. 41% um, of what craft beer is, is draft, compared to 10% for overall beer. So that's a great opportunity at on premise. Draft beer is the opening and the opportunity. And we need to protect the ability to have clean draft lines, right? That's very important. And that beer service is key, especially when you're dealing with draft. Um, cans, what a surprising stat. 18% of craft beer is now canned. Wow. That number goes up and up each year. So a lot of numbers on this, but what I liked about it for you guys is it's showing um, the growth. CE means case equivalent, so a case of beer. So you know, less than 10,000 cases had the most growth in, uh, for breweries that are uh, producing less than 10,000 cases in 2017. That's the bright, brightest spot of beer, is the smallest of the small. And then as you get to more advanced producing, you've got challenges, you've got that tension, you've got that getting bumped off the draft line at retail because one brewery got placed over the other that was already there. And there's definitely concerns that we're watching on behalf of our more advanced producing craft brewers. The regional brewers are getting some challenges in the marketplace that they've never had because there's so much more gain and muscle and power from the big brewers getting into the full flavored beer space. Barrel growth by founded date. Um, our two amazing, uh, my two amazing co-workers, uh, Bart Watson and Paul Gatta at the State of the Industry at the Craft Brewers Conference, which was in Nashville. Anybody go to Nashville for CBC? Yep, got some of you guys. Made in kick ass conference, by the way. We took over Nashville. So cool. Um, but what you've got is the showing of the growth. If you were a brewery, let's look at it by founding date, and you opened before 2013, that whole category or sector of craft brewers, they only grew 1.3% last year. And if you were founded 2014 to 2017, that 
52%. So you've got these new greener breweries advancing what they're doing, but will they be around? Will they become some of those heritage and pioneer brewers decades from now? Well, it's very important they make world-class beer. Um, it's very important they do uh, many, many tried and tested uh, business approaches to be good at both business and beer. But the story will uh, evolve and we will see. Because what we've got is that slowing of growth going on in the craft brewing segment, 5% growth in 2017. We just did our mid-year numbers for the first half of 2018. Craft brewers only grew 5%. That's tough when 10, when eight out of the 10 years prior to 2017, craft brewers grew double digits. So there are challenges and headwinds like there have not been before. There's a lot to discern, but what you really should be focused with is 24,000 permanent alcohol suppliers. So craft brewers and brewers are not just competing with each other, but they're competing with the other beverage categories in a much more robust way. Look at the micro distilling movement. Loud Moon brings up you know, their wineries. And you've got these other beverage categories learning from craft brewers on how to do it, how to be ingrained locally, how to engage your community, how to use your beer and your beverage as a cause for other causes. And so you really do have that, that um, competition also coming from the other beverage categories. And there's something to be, uh, to be watched there. But when anybody always freaks out about the number of breweries, with that 6,600 brewery locations that I mentioned to you in the United States, breweries large and small, that's the total number. You know, wine has more than 12,000 permits, wineries. And that is very important to always point out. So who's drinking craft beer besides us? <laughs> Duh, we're drinking it. Um, I'd like to show this slide, but there's a data disclaimer that I'm going to say. Craft beer is not defined. We as the National Association, driven by the breweries. The breweries define themselves. Craft brewers are defined by the breweries themselves. But craft beer is not defined. Different things to different beer lovers. So when you see any survey data, you have to take it with a grain of salt. You have to take that into account. So I've shown this slide a, a few times, and we have a few data points, and we are starting to work on getting better diversity data. Some of that might be talked about later today. But you know, we still can do better with women. I talk about the three W's for winning for beer, and one of them is women. It's time to get it going. It's 2018. Let's figure this out. But 28% is not enough. Um, just one data point. I've seen upwards of you know 25 to 35% for craft beer is what I usually see, depending on who's done the data. And then you know, speaking about diversity, white, non-Hispanic, Hispanic, African American. Those numbers should not be surprising based on adult populations, but they can be better. We can do better. We should do better. We are working on doing better. So preference is regional, local over national. You cannot see my slide. That sucks. On my laptop, you can see the yellow bars. So all that matters is the number. Of, all that matters is the number at top. But what I want to show you for preference. Which best describes the type of craft beer you typically purchase? And all my data source, different data, different places, this is Nielsen. Regional comes up, 65%, guys. That's fascinating, right? You think it would be local. Local is king. But regional is more readily available. So what's going to happen if our regional craft brewers, who are about less than 200 breweries in the US, are no longer able to get placed at retail? That's going to be detrimental. So we want to see regional have strong pull. We love seeing local have strong pull. And then it's great to have national breweries or, or globally produced breweries have strong pull too. What's not great is when people are not sure at all. It means they didn't know what we were asking them. But we will skip that part. <laughs> Labor and freshness are key. I talk about the business of beer a lot. I always try to bring in the sensory side of beer to remind everybody that that's what it's about. This slide talks about how important are each of the following when choosing a craft beer to purchase. Look at the top one, two, three, four, five, six. Locally made comes in at almost 60%, but the top six are all about sensory attributes. Why? Because we're a beer-loving nation first and foremost, because beer has the most in sales, because beer is a kicking frick-ass frick kick beverage, <coughs> and <coughs> what's in the glass tastes good. We like what's in the glass. It's a sensory beverage. This slide shows that. 
Um, I'm going to talk about something fun here. Juicy hazy. <laughs> so, compared to a few years ago, are you more or less interested in drinking the following types of craft beer? Look at these numbers, juicy or hazy, fruity, hoppy, males are all in, just continues to go up. Wait go. <laughs> Females, 22% gain, right? For juicy or hazy with hoppy at down 7%. That says women are more attracted to the concept of juicy or hazy. All right, for your guys' benefit, I will say New England IPA, but we do not define that in the style guides that way. <laughs> And that is powerful. We, we want business to bring the women back. Beer should bring the women back. It's been marketed as a beverage that discluded us. Let's bring them back. So anyone that was on the dogfish head excursion with me, I, I triggered it on the bus. This is the power of blogs. This is where you guys have power too. Again, I'm one of you. I blog. Andy and Jay and I, we do what you do. And my blog yesterday that dropped, strategically so you guys would share this news, is that for the first time ever, um, or actually for the first time since 2002, the Great American Beer Festival will not have American IPA as the number one style category. What's going to be second? I already answered the question. I should have made you go read my blog to answer the question. <laughs> so if you read my blog, it's going to tell you that American IPA in 2018 for Great American Beer Festival that's coming up in October, only will have 331 entries. American IPA in 2017, wow, had 408. So what happened? Juicy or hazy? We entered three new categories into our style guidelines. Juicy or hazy pale ale, juicy or hazy IPA, juicy or hazy double or imperial IPA. Collectively, for GABF, they got more than 700 entries this year. Out of nowhere, out of the first Year. And so American IPA has been dethroned, and now Juicy or Hazy IPA for 2018 will be the number one entry category at 418 entries. All the information is here, and what will be fascinating to watch, you should get your butts to Great American Beer Festival, um, is who will win that holy grail hazy gold. That's what we want to know. What a great story. Got a lot of other stuff to share with you guys exclusive. This is not on my blog. It's just shared because you guys are here. Um, other entry numbers, American South Pilsner uh, combined with international grew over 70% for entries. Awesome. Love me good pills, right? Age beers doubled in their growth for entries this year with multiple categories for age beers. Fruited American style sour and litter bites grew 46 and 62% uh, respectively. Irish style, the Irish style dry south, fourth largest gainer. That's awesome to see. And then some decliners. Oh, Doppelbach and pumpkin ales. <laughs> <laughs> I would take three pumpkin ales aside for a second. So we can debate about that all day. Love me some Doppelbach. Come on. What's up? Session IPA. Uh -uh. Their game. 
And hey, beer's been pretty good for retailer sales, right? They just have to invest in the education behind it. So if you take the percentages of these two green boxes, 38 and 25, if I did the math right, adds up to 63%. Are total addition new or additional occasions? They're not taking away sales from tap rooms or from, from retail establishments that are better beer providers. Um, I'm gonna bring in this argument. Look what tap rooms do. Really fuzzy, sorry, I grabbed it from the internet. Didn't put it in my creative department. But what the deal is here is look at this, what Pliny the, Pliny the Younger release does for their area in Sonoma. $3.36 million on the release of one beer. Think about beer releases. Think about beer tourism. Think about beer travel. Those tap rooms are bright. It was $3,000 that. You were? How good did it make you $3,000 in that beer? <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about your issues later. <laughs> so, so what I want to point out is tap rooms are good. Now look at this other slide. Why have you chosen to visit a brewery tasting rather than go to a traditional bar, right? We're okay to talk about this topic because we need to figure it out and empower the retailers. The top three reasons, ability to sample, to learn about different beers, I know the beer will be fresh. If retailers feel threatened by tap rooms, can't they own those topics too? It's not about just getting people to the brewery. The reason people are going to the breweries is those top three reasons. So better beer providers can also be on the map because of those if they own their beer education. So that's kind of that. And we want clean glassware and clean draft lines and all that. It's very, very important. So working on behalf of beer at the National Association is a good kind of tail end of my deck. So much is on the horizon for beer. Beth brought it up, story ideas. I, I'm, I'm planting you guys very important topics. I want you guys to further these topics. Has anyone been following 0.05 and lowering the drinking limit to 0.05? Let me put it in perspective. You guys have heard me say this, you've heard me speak. But I stand here as my space on this universe, the best space I have. I'm like 100 pounds in a wet towel, <laughs> right? <laughs> 0.05 in Utah, I am illegal to get in my car and drive after one beer. If I was a 120 pound female, that would also be the case. So I have 20 pounds of buffer that I can gain to still give me that, but this is what's happening. 0.05 is a threat and a criminalization of responsible appreciation. And it's a very important topic because it's coming on strong and we think we're going to see more and more. So, you know, Utah passed it, other states are looking at it. I want some of you guys to dig in and get at the 0.05 topic and get at the importance of responsible appreciation. What will happen to retail and hospitality establishments if 0.05 becomes in multiple states? It's not just about business, it's about the criminalization of responsible appreciation. It's a very important topic. I can go on about all these other things. But they're there for you, come find me, and we'll talk about it in more depth. Dissecting craft beer data, I said it, take it with a grain of salt. Craft beer is different things to different people, plus the scan data companies always scan that UPC code. Some of them take in the data differently, some of them consider certain brewers craft brewers, some of them don't. What would be really cool is everybody just follow our tried, true to test it since 2006 definition of what a craft brewer is because the breweries in the United States, more than 70% of them, had to find themselves. So government affairs is important. I went um, and did a, a question to some of my coworkers that are involved and engaged on topics at the association on behalf of breweries. Katie Marisic, who lives in the D.C. area, uh, you know, wanted me to put uh, several topics on your mind. Federal excise tax. Anybody know about that much? After 10 years' work, we at the Brewers Association and working with other representative groups, um, really finally saw progress and got a two-year, though, two-year tax relief for brewers. Won't go into all the numbers, but what's important is that two-year, it's not permanent. So now our work is about making that permanent, and we want you guys forwarding that message. Dig into why it's not permanent. Dig into how it helps our breweries. 
dig into how it can help our country even more. We need to make it permanent so we can just focus on other things. The tax relief was very important, and breweries are doing what they said they would do with the money that they have been given. Others, the tariffs, anyone been following this? Very complex. If you ask me about it, I might be able to muddle through. You know, there's tariffs on, on China steel, and there's general tariffs. But we're, you know, it's a concern. Brewers, think about where brewers use <coughs> aluminum and steel. And it is not a national security issue, which is one reason why it actually was put into motion. Um, that's our argument. And the, and the problem is that these tariffs are going to cost brewers a lot of money. The price of beer um, possibly could go up from it. That is um, a major concern. So these tariffs really deserve a little bit more fleshing out and attention, and we do not want them to, uh, to stick. Partial tariffs already have happened on imports from China don't affect um, you know, across the board brewery equipment, but it affects valves and certain things that go into that equipment. And so anyway, you don't just have cans to deal with, you've got kegs. Brewers use a lot of steel and aluminum in many different parts of the stream of their brewing process. Technical resources. I know no other organization that puts in more resources to get beer to be world class and to have quality world class beer for brewers. Um, a lot of our information is free to the breweries. You don't even have to be a member to get it. OSHA has very strict requirements, and we've got so many new breweries. How many new breweries understand the OSHA requirements and understand good manufacturing processes and what they have to follow? All of that is through their national association at BrewersAssociation.org, and we're busy investing the membership dollars to build these resources to support breweries so they know what's expected of them out of the gates instead of figuring it up down the line or after they've already been fined. Ingredients. We spend a lot of work on raw materials and access to that. Um, some fun trivia. Citra has replaced Cascade. Whoa, go figure. As the largest acreage for hop aroma. Amazing. And news to many of you, Idaho has suppressed Oregon as the second most prolific hop producing state. Wow. And then keep an eye on the Malter Guild. There's more than 50 now. Um, craft maltsters, and then I love hearing that a brewery is doing malting themselves, very complex process. Barley doesn't just turn into beer, as we know. The maltsters are key in all this, and having heirloom malt brought back to the table, and craft maltsters that are approaching it, um, you know, in a very uh, small, micro way is good for beer. Hop breeding, we have spent millions of dollars on technical quality research, and now we're in the business of hop breeding. The National Association will literally be fueling hop acreage, and we will making it available to all. If you haven't paid attention, some of those hops are proprietary. Simcoe, for example, you'll see a little registered trademark. Well, what happens if one brewer or one producer controls all that hop? Then it's not good for everybody. So back to what's good for beer. We are now engaging this. This is at least a 10-year project, um, working with the USDA, Washington State University, and look for more news on it, or, or, or ask us about it when we tell you the latest. So, bring me to the seal, lots going on. Independent craft beer seal, anybody see it up at Dogfish? <coughs> anybody see it up at Two Silos? They took their money, they printed the seal. We didn't send that to them, we just sent them the image because they said we want the art. Amazing things are happening in the business of beer. And amazing things are happening in the, in the world of differentiation. The beer lover needs to know. The beer lover has a right to know. And then let the beer lover decide who to support brewery-wise. But it's, it's absolutely key. We're seeing illusion of choice in the marketplace. And I want to remind everybody, you know, we see there's an <coughs> exclusives at retail across the tech. I was told that this establishment, and I stay in a lot of Hilton's, um, all the beers were for one producer, and then they switched it out for our arrival. Well, good, because I would have given them some bad press over seeing it one pair of company. It's all about not just one pair of company. Let's keep it fair. Large brewers, big global conglomerates have a right to grow, but not at the expense of small brewers. That's our point. Everybody should have a chance to grow. So look for the independent craft brewer seal. You do a story that mentions it, ping me, and we'll get you the image to show it. We need people to start to see this. We want people to be aware of this upside down beer bottle that more than 3,600 craft brewers have already signed on to use. So they are proud to say we are small and independent and hey beer lovers and retailers, support us. Ambassadors, 
Oh my gosh, we have this, we, these, are, these people are all our ambassadors. One's in the room, Dr. J. She's speaking next. Okay. Look at the work we do. You guys can get story ideas from any of this. Quality instructor, <coughs> Ruby historian, Teresa McCullough, National Museum of American History. The Smithsonian has a brewing historian that we are the lead sponsors behind. Very important stuff going on. Sustainability mentor, John Steer. Safety ambassador. We're saving brewers' livelihoods and lives. Safety is a huge topic for us. Draft Beer Quality, our executive chef that Andy, Jess, Jay, and I work with, Chef Adam Dooley, Culinary Institute of Trained America chef. These are some of the forays. We're about, as an association, what's next of next. Our members, our committees, and our board of directors, we think about what's next of next. And this is some of the work as a result of that. Are these people in the marketplace advancing? And, and I'm super jazzed to hear Dr. J and Julie talk about diversity. So that leads me to my last slide, diversity. I think it's very important to um, make sure that you guys all realize that we want beer, I'm looking at my notes because I want to get this right. We want, we want beer to be better, we want beer to be good, we want beer to be inclusive. Beer is an avenue not just to the beverage in our bellies, but it's an avenue to culture, it's an avenue to geography, it's an avenue to history, it's a connection to each other. There should be no room, and, and this should be a safe space. So let's make that, and let's, let's get at that. So we are. The association from the American Homebrewers Association has initiatives to advance homebrewing in a more diverse way. And then the, NAT, the BA has initiatives, including our diversity committee that Julie chairs, um, and our diversity ambassador and investment in that to make the beverage of beer be more accessible and to start to get a handle on what diversity does and does not exist in craft brewing. And so if the topic of diversity comes up to you guys, I don't want to continue to see the headlines that there's you know, just one side of it. There is diversity in craft brewing. We can talk about so many bright spots. So let's remember to bring those forth and parts those out as much as we can also take you know, look at what can also be done better and where. So I might be out of time. Um, I am around. I'm even going to Richmond. All in, you guys. <laughs> Adventures and the hard work that goes on to get us to be this collective powwow. Um, it's one of my favorite times of the year. And so I will leave it at that. Say good beers to you guys, and I look forward to hanging out. Thank you, Julia. We'll get one more round of applause. <laughs> Served an excellent transition into our uh, first all group panel that we have for this morning. Uh, as much fun as it is to talk about things uh, that are glittery or hazy or juicy, uh, we feel with a conference like this, we also have a responsibility um, to further discussions that are going on that are, that are very important that don't always have to do with how something tastes or how it looks in our glass. And uh, it, to get this going today, uh, we get to be joined by our good friend, Carla G. <coughs> how many know Carla? If <laughs> uh, you didn't raise your hand, then uh, now, you, now you have something to do here. Uh, but I will let her uh, uh, show you guys and, and, and open this up. And, for our very next presentation on diversity in beer. Great, and if you'll set, uh, just bear with us while we get things settled up, if I can have uh, the three panelists come on up here.
So uh, I have the, I guess, not privilege of following Julia Hurst's <laughs> talk. Um, awesome opening, uh, awesome opening presentation so far today, and I kind of want to get uh, from a point where we are kind of listening to what's going on to actually having a little bit of back and forth and discussion about this. So I, uh, as I was introduced, um, Carla Lauder. I'm a freelance beer writer, but I've been writing for beer blog. Uh, the Bureau of Age since 2007. I'm now a columnist for a uh, newspaper in Maine. But I am, you know, totally honored to be joined on stage by these three incredible women. Um, and I really hope that we can learn a lot from them, you know, about their experiences in craft beer and reflect on where we're going as an industry. As Julie mentioned, um, you know, we've got this great community of beer lovers out there, and we really want to try to strengthen the diversity of the people that are working in beer, participating in craft beer, drinking craft beer, and also just making craft beer as a whole a more inclusive and welcoming environment for everybody. So I want to, without uh, any further hesitation, introduce our three panelists. Um, I'm going to start on this side um, with Dr. Jane Cole Jackson Becker. She is an assistant professor of communication studies at Randolph College in Lynchburg, Virginia, um, and has been doing in research her uh, area, particularly exploring what might be called the everyday politics of food and drink. Um, and in April, she was named the Diversity Ambassador to the Brewers Association and has been working with uh, Julie Barati in the Brewers Association Diversity Committee. Um, in the center here, we have Bev Armstrong, who's a former biotech executive and rugby player turned brewery owner. Uh, and she is at the helm of Brazo Forte, the first female owned brewery in Massachusetts. Uh, both BA and MBA from Harvard and a Harvard Law School graduate as well. And in 2017, she won the Sam Adams uh, Brewing the American Dream Business and Brewing Experienceship, um, which is only given to one brewery per year, and it includes the opportunity to be mentored by Jim Cook and to work with Samuel Adams on crafting a budding business. And last but definitely not least is Julie Barak, off the end, uh, who is the founder of Denison's Brewing Company in Silver Spring, Maryland. Anybody been to Denison? People, all right. Uh, and she was a presidential, uh, presidential Management Fellow and Senior Policy Advisor at the U.S. Small Business Administration before that. Um, she also has a law degree, so lots of, lots of knowledge and education on one stage here uh, from George Washington University. And Julie is currently uh, the chair of the Brewers Association Diversity Committee. Um, we only have an hour for this panel, a little bit uh, shorter than that, so I'm going to uh, let each of the panelists talk a little bit about themselves, um, and then we're going to go through uh, some moderated questions, and then if we have a little bit of time at the end, we may open it up uh, to the group. But this morning we heard from Julia Hers, uh, obviously, about the state of the craft beer world, including some of the demographics about who's drinking the beer that's getting made. But in a way, it's also important to look at the beer industry itself and ask who is not here, and what can we do to make the industry more welcome uh, and more inclusive. Uh, both as brewers, drinkers, and writers, um, there are definitely things that we can do to get more diversity in our craft here. So the purpose of today's panel is to dig a little bit deeper into that and hear from the experiences of folks that have both been vocal about it, but have also uh, been advocates for increasing <coughs> participation. So I want to just start by giving the panelists a couple minutes to talk about what you guys do. What do you guys think the state of craft beer is you know, in your world uh, as far as opening up and being inclusive? Where are we at? So I can you know, start on either end and kind of You have the mic. You can use it. Go for it. Uh, all right. Where are we? Uh, I would say, if I had to use one word to describe where we are within craft beer right now, I would say excitement. Um, I think for all of the challenges or opportunities, as I like to see them, um, as far as diversity and other things are concerned, this is an exciting time uh, to be interested in, a part of, and committed to craft beer. Um, and I've, for uh, a really long time, felt that one of the most compelling and interesting uh, things about this particular industry is its ability to look at the state of affairs or the status quo and just say, meh, we're gonna do something different. Um, and if, in this regard, uh, diversity and inclusion is, is just about the same. Proper, they're looking at the ways that we've approached this issue as a, as a country, um, as and authentic, and rather aggressive effort um, to be the industry we want to be, and I think it's an exciting time to be part of that. Hi, Beverly Shum. Um, yeah, I would definitely echo the sense that 
we are at a great time in the craft beer industry. Um, I think we've had a great uh, first wave of a revolution, uh, which has elevated craft beer. Um, uh, but I think we're on the verge of a new uh, revolution, the uh, next generation of new beer brewers, uh, more diverse um, drinkers, to both on the production side and on the <coughs> consumption side. I think we're at an exciting point uh, for, for new and uh, more diverse spaces to bring into the industry. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me here. Thanks for your question. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, if I were to describe it, the industry in general, I think it's really growth and newness. Um, and all the good and exciting successes that come with that and also the really scary shit that happens with that and uh, the screw-ups and the mistakes that happen. And um, I think that uh, one of the things that I'm very excited about uh, is that the VA is looking at diversity and inclusion in a very serious way. And it's not just lip service bullshit. You know, we're actually putting financial resources behind this effort. Uh, you know, hiring Dr. J, uh, making sure that we are really spreading a message of inclusivity. Um, you know, I think that in, in any sort of endeavor, you just kind of have to put your head down when you first start and you're just sort of trying to get it done, get it done, get it done. And I think that the industry is sort of lifting its head up a little bit right now and looking around and seeing, okay, where can we actually create long-term changes um, to make sure we're growing at a much steadier pace? Because, and I say this all the time, I think diversity and inclusion as an endeavor is not just a moral need, but also a business and economic need. You know, there's so many more craft breweries that exist now. Uh, you know, we opened in 2014. We're definitely part of the long tail um, out in Silver Spring. Um, and if we're all going after the same pie, if every single one of us, all these craft brewers that have opened up, are going after that same demographic circle of straight white men in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, uh, we're going to start fighting with each other because there's not that many of them and it's going to continue to decrease as demographic changes happen in this country. Uh, so I think we need to really, as a business imperative, grow that pie and bring in new customers, bring in new people into the industry, not just drinking our products, but also working for our companies. Uh, so that, that's what I would say for that question. Great. Um, so uh, I think this can either be for Dr. J or for Julie. What do you see the Brewers Association role, um, you know, of that, so that that diversity committee? Where, where do you see that, you know, playing a part? What is it? What is its kind of role in the beer industry? Or promoting? Well, I mean, as the Brewers Association is the trade organization for all the small and independent breweries in this in this country, um, and. Uh, like Julia said, I think 70% uh, are actual members, these paying members of the organization. So, you know, it's it's our job as a trade organization to be the voice of the entire industry and to really push this message forward. And, you know, we have the financial resources. You know, it's not the role of, well, that's not true. I think individually craft brewers uh, can spend time and resources on increasing diversity and inclusion, but they're not going to have as much of an impact if it's not coming from a national organization. So that's where I really see the VA's role. I don't know if you wanted to add to that, Dr. Jim. Sure. Um, I would also, just as an ed educator by trade, I think um, being the uh, source of both resources, guidance, um, and data, right? Usable data is a really important role that the VA is taking. Um, again, you know, Julie talks a lot of diversity and inclusion efforts in that being kind of like cheerleading sessions, and um, the VA is really intentional about um, rather than just being cheerleaders, which we will, right? Like, yeah, right. Uh, but but um, we want usable, um, functional, and tactical data and resources that that uh, industry members can use, um, and just being uh, the source of that kind of information is important. Um, I want to turn it over to Beth for a second. Um, one of the, you know, in, in addition to gathering data and really kind of seeing what's going on, uh, there are some uh, programs out there that are you know, trying to help with mentoring and that type of thing. So I wanted to see if Beth wanted to talk a little bit about the Sam Adams uh, program that uh, that you were the recipient of and kind of how that um, kind of changed your trajectory as far as you were. Um, um, yeah, that's. Um, we'd love to talk about that. Uh, so the. Um, in my opinion, one of the greatest barriers um, to uh, more diversity is to, uh, need to uh, increase the pipeline of um, 
both people within the breweries and also the pipeline of new drinkers. Uh, and to do that, um, we need role models, we need mentoring, you know, uh, we need um, new people coming in. Don't have the same, if you don't know people in the industry already, uh, it's much harder to call someone up and say, you know, what kind of guy, what should I do? Um, so having role models and uh, mentors is key in that program really um, <coughs> made that happen for me. Uh, it made a huge difference in terms of um, my ability to access capital, um, uh, education, uh, and, and all the things that you need to make sure that new people coming in are continuing to make great people. Um, so you mentioned, you know, role models and just being able to kind of, you know, see people that have gone through that pipeline and kind of bring you forward. One of the things that uh, I've been thinking about is this is a room full of writers, right? We, we are covering our local industries, we're covering our national, uh, covering lots of different aspects. But to the people in this room, and I'd, I'd love to hear from all of you guys on this, what are the stories that, you know, kind of we're not covering? What are the questions that we're not asking that could help either to uh, increase uh, visibility for um, folks that are already in the industry or just could continue to propel the conversation forward? Because I feel like there's some that are just, um, you know, there's some stories out there that maybe or questions that we're just not asking. That we could. Uh, I have two examples of that. Uh, one is try to ask more diverse people, whether it's women, it's people of color, um, different gender, sexualities, ethnicities, to questions about their expertise in the industry. Uh, I can't tell you, you know, I run sales and distribution. We've been self-distributing for four years. I screw things up all the time. I don't know everything. I still have a lot to learn. But I have a pretty solid expertise on distribution. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked about that. Not once, actually. I've never been asked to talk about that in an article. I've been asked to talk about what's it like to be a woman in, woman in beer, what's it like to be LGBT, uh, th those type of questions. I've never been asked about distribution. So that's one example. Use more people uh, in, your, in your articles about expertise. The second thing I would say is maybe you should consider asking straight white men why there's not more diversity in beer instead of just asking women and people of color when you're writing articles. So that's another option for a topic. Uh, yeah, I, that. <laughs> <laughs> if you need more minutes to write it down, I'll shut up for a second. Um, but I would say two other things. Um, and one, you know, absolutely echoes what Julie just said. Um, please don't totalize, which is um, reduce people to a very narrow category of their identity as if that is the only thing about them. And one of the things that actually is um, starting to bother me the most, because I think a lot about drinkers and producers, is actually how much we talk about bearded white men as a uniform category of people. But they're actually a lot different from each other, too. Um, and I think it's worth keeping the point that, like, Individuals are individuals, um, and like talking about people in big gangs is just never really that useful. Um, secondarily, um, and again, this also ties to the idea of like talk to people about different aspects and expertise, um, diversify the voices that are going in there. Um, I would say, please also tell the story of diversity in craft beer with nuance. Um, I've done a lot of media um, interactions in the last couple of months, and I can't tell you how many times I've been asked the same three questions. Um, why is it so bad? Can you give me an example of how bad it is? And then in three points, how do we fix it? And I'm like, <laughs> wow, right? If we can fix it in three points, like I should just like skip the ambassadorship and run for office. <laughs> um, so it's a complex story. It's got roots in history. It's got roots in things that are going on more broadly, social and culturally and economically in the United States. Um, and so you have to approach the story with, with an eye towards complexity or you're not telling a very good story. Um, and then to that end, and secondarily, um, realize that um, this is not a quick fix. All right, it's why the Brewers Association is being so deliberate. It's taking time, it's taking money. Um, if we can eradicate, you know, these types of problems with a three-point bulleted list, I think they'd be gone already. 
Um, and another thing, you know, instead of asking always how bad the problem is, I think quantifying the opportunities we have to diversify the industry is a smart thing to do. It's a great starting place. But recognize that many brewers, and in fact, more than I ever could have expected, are already on board with this effort. Right. My job as ambassador has not been running around trying to convince people that diversity and inclusion is a good idea. Pretty much everybody's like, yep. Right. What I see right now is an industry full of people who have a sincere intention to do this and simply don't know how to execute it, and they are frustrated, and if you think it bothers people like me who go in and say, ugh, lack of diversity, imagine being a business owner who has a particular set of personal ethics and you see your baby out there and it's not what you want it to be. Have some compassion for those folks who are working really hard because it is a frustrating situation for many people in this country. I mean, I'll just add a couple of points that are very completely with uh, what's been said already. Um, I think there are some really interesting stories out there to find. Uh, it's, it's sometimes hard to find those stories, uh, but finding the stories and telling the stories only helps to grow um, the market overall. It actually grows the audience for the beer companies, it grows your audience. As a, as a storyteller, uh, creates a new group of people to uh, educate about beer. Um, so that's really important. Uh, and then focusing, again, not on gender or age, or race, those are like six, you know, maybe number 10 on uh, most interesting things. Uh, I'd say it's like uh, focusing on beer itself and what's being done, the expertise that's being brought, brought to producing it uh, and the quality of beer. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so, Dr. J, uh, I have a, uh, another point to bring up there about your role as the beer ambassador. In some of your initial interviews about this position, you kind of mentioned that you're, you know, you don't see your role as to kind of act, act as police, you know, to kind of sit there and point out wrong. Um, but you know, kind of, what are some of the crucial areas that you see that can be where progress can be made without doing that type of kind of, uh, you know, one-off? You know, you are not doing well, and you are not yeah, sure. Um, so I think share, what's starting to happen informally and hopefully will be formalized in the coming months um, is a, a good amount of information sharing. Um, one of the things that I find myself saying quite often is that diversity and diversity and inclusion efforts are going to be different depending on where you are located. A brewer located in uh, Jackson, Mississippi is going to have different diversity challenges that you are going to have in Boston. It's just the, the nature of different right, geographic regions, different histories, different things, et cetera. Um, however, some people are having similar problems, and one um, might be, how do we increase the pipeline of good labor in my brewery and make sure that that particular pipeline is reflective of the community where my brewery is located? Um, the nice thing that's happening is that um, as I'm going across the country to talk to different groups, people who are having some successes are sharing those successes and able to share them with somebody who's you know, talking about the frustration that they're having um, somewhere else across the country. And so I think one of the uh, more important roles is, is just going to be a conduit of information sharing. Um, definitely. Um, and then as Julia um, referred to earlier in her talk, um, putting out um, some good data, collecting and putting out the data that people can use to uh, benchmark where, where they are, measure when they're having successes, um, do some comparison, um, both nationally and regionally. And uh, I want to toss it back to Julie for a second to actually talk about uh, the brewery. Uh, so in your uh, <laughs> uh, you have mentioned uh, Dr. Grinia in your company article where you had said that there are specific staff trainings and things that you do to actually make your brewery a more welcoming and inclusive place. Can you talk a little bit about like what you have done in your own uh, brewery to kind of establish that um, as a goal? Yeah, sure. So uh, there's, there's a couple of things and some of it also is uh, about the beer itself and what we offer on tap at the brewery. Uh, but in terms of staff training, you know, we do quarterly trainings and meetings with all staff um, every quarter it's called quarterly. Um, so I this morning. Um, you know, and we, we talk about, you know, how to be more inclusive, but we empower people on staff and empower managers if, you know, someone is behaving inappropriately, how to handle that situation. 
um, and we back them up as owners. You know, if a manager makes a decision that somebody needs to be removed because they're harassing a customer or harassing a staff member, we back them up and say, yeah, you made the right call. That's inappropriate and that's totally okay that you did that. Um, that's just one example. Uh, and in terms of how we try to make a more inclusive tap room and community for our, for our brewery is we have a very wide range of beers that we make. We don't just make IPAs. You know, so we make beers for every single palate. So if you walk into our brewery tap room, I promise you, you're not gonna like every single beer we have on tap, but you're gonna find at least two or three that you will really enjoy. And we do that with the idea that we need to have a more inclusive and broad range of styles to offer people because it, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that, you know, we're in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is, it took me 40 minutes to drive here this morning in rush hour. Um, it's not, it wasn't too, too, too uh, far or too long, but, um, our community over there in Silver Spring is extremely diverse. I mean, and I'm talking everything from age to ethnicity to socioeconomic, um, sexual orientation to gender. Um, and it's, you know, we would be doing a disservice to our community if we weren't creating opportunities for a wide range of offerings for people. And that's something that we, we do very proactively. And Beth, do you want to talk about your brewery a little bit and how you address similar issues? Uh, well, starting out by focusing on inclusion from the start uh, in every possible way. Um, so it got you know, just defined in terms of gender or ethnicity, uh, but in every possible way, because that's, uh, again, how uh, I feel like I can help grow uh, by being welcoming um, and, and uh, inclusive to every um, audience. Um, that only helps grow the market. Um, uh, and you know, for, for me, I think I have a little bit of a, you know, I'm out in the community a lot. I do tastings in uh, places that other craft beer uh, brewers don't um, to venture. You know, I mean, I've, I've um, <coughs> gone to a, it's funny, I've gone to a craft beer conferences for I don't, nine years or so, and I've seen marketing panels where um, someone, the, the person leading the panel, uh, literally say something like, don't bother marketing in Curiosity X because they, they don't like great beer. Right? <coughs> That's what he said. And so that drives me crazy. Uh, so I I, um, I like to bring my great beer everywhere, uh, and people really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, 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 I'm a big fan of the idea that you know your taste buds are not gendered; they don't have a race. There, you know, they're, they're you're going to appreciate good beer no matter who you are. Uh, so that's that's fantastic. Um, for you know some of us in the room, uh, you know we started off, you know when we were talking about what you guys thought the state of craft beer, what you know was for you guys that there were bright spots and you're kind of excited. Do you have any kind of anecdotes about what maybe what you've seen change, you know, kind of as uh, as you've been involved in craft beer or anything that in particular stood out as being a bright spot um, for you guys? I mean, the fact that the diversity committee was formed yeah. is is a huge bright spot. Um, you know, I was not the first chair. Scott Metzger, I should give a shout out to him from Freetail Brewing, he was the first chair of the committee and he really helped kick it off and grow it. Um, and I was lucky enough to take it over just this past February. Uh, but that, for me, I think it's a huge bright spot example. Yeah, that's it. Just the fact that people are getting more comfortable uh, even discussing the topic uh, is, uh, is a bright spot. Um, something that uh, growing awareness um, helps to eliminate that, or at least help to, helps to make less of a barrier um, to uh, moving forward. So that's really exciting. And the people I find are very excited when, um, you know, when I go to festivals uh, and I'm pouring beer, and uh, you know, I get the question, so where's the brewer? And, you know, and, I, and I tell them, well, you know, I'm the brewer. We can talk about beer for the last five minutes. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and they're all surprised, but also pleasantly surprised. So that's been a great. Um, um, element where people really are excited to have more more faces coming into the uh, Yeah, I think just the change. Um, I distinctly remember attending a kind of rare, rare beer fest. I won't name it by name because it's not a good for um, Ten years ago, around 2008, and uh, there were I was one of three women women in the room who were not um, working the festival and the women who were working the festival actually had um, beer and pictures and were like moving around filming up tasters um, and I was the only person of color in the room and I remember all night long people just kept walking up to me with their glass and I was like um, <laughs> uh, 
the festival experience is radically different in Tango Square. It's just that it's, yeah, I can't even really compare them. They're two totally different experiences. Um, all sorts of people, um, age, gender, race, right? I mean, again, you still have some opportunities to grow, but it, it is, the tenure change is really remarkable and something to be um, celebrated. So again, going back to the fact that you know we're kind of a room full of writers here, and I know you guys, that's not your uh, you know primary uh, business, but you've been definitely on the receiving end of being written about. So I feel like you know maybe it's fair to ask this, but is uh, are have you run across you know things that we could improve to you know as far as what people are asking for questions? What should how can we kind of spotlight people who have you know made it into the industry without kind of tokenizing them or you know kind of making them feel like that's the only reason they were asked to be in an art building. What is, what is the balance there for us, you know, as far as what we can do to kind of, you know, highlight some of these bright spots or just highlight awesome people in our industry, um, you know, kind of without, without kind of going overboard and making them kind of speak, you know, be representative of, you know, a whole entire group. Um, so any advice, you know, just to the writers in the room of, you know, what, you know, things that happen to you or just in general, you know, what you recommend for, you know, for us as far as what we're covering. <laughs> oh, sure. I, I'll, um, I'd say please uh, continue to um, elevate the beer. Um, it's all about beer. It's all about making great beer. And that should be the most important um, need. Um, but you can find some really great stories out there um, and, and continue to tell those stories in a way that does not siloize. You know, it's not the, the, the woman brewer who makes beer for women. You know, uh, more appeal. You know, Hispanic brewer makes beer for Hispanics. Please do not do that. Right. Um, so talk more about elevating the beer, elevating the um, expertise that has been served, uh, and, and um, just telling, uh, go ahead and tell the stories. I mean, I think it's just really about relationships and just looking for those stories. So asking, you guys all have relationships with certain brewers, I assume. Uh, just ask them ideas about people that maybe you haven't met or you haven't talked to, or is there any brewery around here that you know, somebody we should highlight, or something that that brewery is doing that doesn't usually get written about. Um, I think it's really just going to have a ripple effect if you just proactively search for those stories. Um, I would just say, um, remember what Julia was saying is us being a nation of beer drinkers. I mean, um, you know, for the last 150 years, Americans have drank beer in per capita volumes that rival coffee and milk. Um, so, you know, roughly 25 to 30 gallons per capita, right? Um, so remember that, like, beer isn't just something that we consume or have fun with. Beer is the story of this country, right? Because of, you know, beer experience, we, we changed our constitution, right? The, the only time we've ever amended our constitution to restrict rights was related um, to what was happening with beer and alcohol. The only time we've ever changed it back. Right? <laughs> right? Um, like we, we, this, is, this is the story of the, of the U.S. Um, and if you're thinking about the story of diversity, inclusion, and craft beer, you're also talking about the story of the U.S. Right? So remember that that's not a story just about beer. That's a story about where we are um, as a country, both socially and culturally and politically. Um, and I would charge you to take that challenge and that story extremely seriously. Um, because it's it's a bigger story than just beer, but it's, it's always been bigger than just beer. So I think uh, I have kind of one one more question about being a writer, and then maybe we'll open it up for us some questions in the audience. Um, I, a couple of you alluded this to this earlier. What is one question you never want to be asked ever again? <laughs> Other than what are the top three things we can do? Yeah, that. <laughs> okay, yeah, so that's yours. <laughs> Everybody else have one? Just can't stand. Because, you know, sometimes we, you know, we're well meaning, but we... I, I actually don't have one. Okay. I'm kind of an open book. You can ask me whatever. I might not answer you. <laughs> 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 you can ask me whatever you want. Um, that's a tough one. I mean, I think um, it, the typical questions, um, um, do you focus on the negative as opposed to the positive? Uh, so things like, you know, have you experienced racism, you know, barriers, those kinds of questions just get really tired um, after a while. I mean, um, 
again, I, I've been focusing on, on my education, uh, on, on my training, on making high quality theater. Those are the kinds of questions that, that, that we asked about. All right, so if anyone has questions for our panelists, I'll ask you to kind of raise your hand or call on you. You can shout it to me and I'll repeat it if we need to. So, Ken, I see you in the front. Um, wow, on. you read my tag from there? That's impressive. You're in the front row. I don't okay. know. I can't hear you. My eyes don't work that well. I don't know how yours did anyway. So I had a question about programming. So we're focused on the beer, and the beer should be the focus because we're beer writers and fighters. But um, other ways to deal with inclusion, perhaps deal with the kind of programming that the breweries themselves offer. So you're my neighbor to the north. I'm from Virginia. Um, and also in a very diverse community in northern Virginia. So some of these things you know, we don't see, right? Because we have diverse groups at our breweries. But let me get to my question, right? As an investor, as people involved in the industry, should we be focused on talking about the programming that the breweries have to bring people in? For example, go anywhere in the country, you're gonna see yoga night, running club night, um, trivia night, games night. Should there be more, or should we just be focusing on getting people to drink the beer? Um. So programming is actually something I talk about quite a bit when I visit Brewers Guild and talk to Brewers because it is a way to form relationships with your community, right? Um, I think it sometimes can be a little bit tricky when you start thinking of programming as a way to lure people in. So I was wondering about pandering. I don't, you know. Right, um, and so um, I, I, try, I try to kind of shift the perspective and like this isn't about luring people, but it's about relationships, right? Like. Um, and the, the important part about relationships is that they're not just about what you think the relationship is about. Right? They're about like people both bringing their own interests. You know? So one of the one of the cooler things I've done in brewery programming late, recently was yarn crawl. Right? Any knitters? In there? <laughs> uh huh. Right? Uh, like we like basically knitted and drank beer in as many places, and I was like. Best thing I've ever done. <laughs> um, and it wasn't necessarily because the brewery was like, we'll try to lure the women, but there was a really active like fiber art group in the community, and two people got talking, and they're like, we should do a thing, right? Relationship. And um, it happened to be a great thing. It brought out a huge group of um, women and men, uh, and a lot of brewers got to meet a lot of new customers, and it was a really fun time. Um, sure. Oh, did you want to answer? Anybody want to answer that? I would say with the, that uh, I mean programming. Programming is a great thing as long as it's being done in the right way and it's being done in an authentic way. You know, not with the idea that oh, we want to sell more beer to women, but to want to in general want to uh, expand and grow the market. So it's not a pandering thing. It's literally for a business and economic reason. The same way that that uh, a yoga studio might have a beer night because they just have fusion things coming. To the, to the yoga center, right? Or right, right. a body shop, right? right. So it, it has to be uh, authentically done for the right reasons to, to, to move the market. Additional questions? In the back. Oh, hi. Hey, good morning, guys. Um, I think one of the things that benefits myself and certainly other writers is finding sure. response because my answer is good beer hunting <laughs> um, which I know you've done a lot of writing on and I, and I will I will amend what I said earlier about uh, stuff because Brian and I have actually had some conversations that weren't just focused on me being a female in beer and diversity but um, yeah I think good beer hunting has done a lot of really good work on this um, I, I don't read a ton of blogs um, I you know I try to I mostly look at stuff on Twitter, so if you guys are retweeting things, I probably right. skip through it or <laughs> read through it. Um, but yeah, I've been very impressed with how uh, the beer hunting has been covering this issue and looking at it from a wide range of perspectives. I mean, I, I, I personally, as a as someone in the industry and as a reader, I really appreciate that approach. 
What you may all not know is that Brian has written two articles while sitting here this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would say, and this is obviously biased, but um, I would love to see people go into academic literature more um, to go to research and find um, information that can be used. Um, just some uh, couple favorites for mine. Um, the Journal of Consumer Research does really great just conser consumer research um, on lots of different industries. That's really helpful. Um, a lot of the data that I use in my role as ambassador um, comes from, again, just broad industry re research about the efficacy of various approaches to diversity and inclusion. So that's not necessarily about beer, it's just about um, organizational approaches to diversity and inclusion um, in general. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the, there's a, a journal called Food Culture and Society that I go to quite a lot. It's published by the Association for the Study of Food and Society. Um, they've done a fair amount of article work on both beer, wine, and spirits, so you can find a ton of stuff there. Um, and if you want any other um, suggestions, I'm happy to give them to I'll, I'll be around for a little bit today. Um, but, and I know academic literature is lengthy and often written in crazy ways, um, but there's some, there's some good tidbits there, and if you want to chat about this, you know, um, I'm mean, happy to do some with you. So, Oh, come on. Oh, there, you go. there you go. Um, growing up, a long time ago, um, on TV they had all the commercials, etc. And then over time they started building diversity into that. And since the craft beer industry is relatively small compared to Coca-Cola or Budweiser, I'm just wondering, because it seems like advertising is a big part of trying to get uh, people to think about using these different types of products. So, you think that's a possibility for the craft beer industry to improve there? I mean, the short answer is yes. I will also say that the Brewers <coughs> Association, and Julia might be able to, sorry to put it on you, but we have been working as an organization to increase. Um, you know, photography, and do you, do you want to actually talk about that a little it's, bit? I should have mentioned it, it's a quick one. Um, we've had a program for over a year where if you want stock photography on non-branded, and that's key, because really to represent the beverage, and if you guys are acting in the journalist fashion, you don't want brands on that, come to us through our media relations agency, if any of you haven't worked with them, the Rosen Group, I can connect you with them, Andy or Jay can, or you go straight to them, Abby at the Rosen Group, and they will plug you in. We have a whole brand folder, digital online, already set up. You just plug in your info, and it's non-branded styles, glassware. It's beer in the way that we desire it to be visually presented. And then people, too, is the whole point. People in events, and we're trying for real good, diverse photos in people in events. Yeah. Um, and I also think that breweries can uh, do a better job, whether you, they're doing Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, to have more diverse photos of folks that are enjoying their product, that they're promoting themselves. Um, you know, we try to do that. Um, we're not the best at it. Um, we're, there's always room for improvement, obviously. Um, but that is uh, something that I think individual breweries can do. And if you're writing an article, look proactively look for those types of photos to put into your articles. And contact Julia for that. Yeah, I tell you, I think uh, marketing and advertising is key to normalizing the vision um, that that allows people to see themselves you know, in the craft beer segment, uh, whether as a producer or, or a consumer. Uh, and, you know, I approach um, marketing much uh, like a, uh, an HBS case study, like a business school case study. You analyze the market and you figure out, you know, uh, I could be Pepsi Co. You know, trying to figure out what kinds of ads uh, are going to um, make my product a lot more appealing to more people. Uh, so I do think that's it. All right. I know you have more questions on this because we've had panels about this for the last three years and you know it's kind of come up tangentially. I want to hear it from you guys directly. So that's a challenge. Andy. Hi. Um, okay, I want to kind of ask this question without sounding like a dumbass because this is, of course, what you've been talking about this entire time. Um, but, in, you know, given that there's not really three bullet point answer to this, um, 
how can I, I like as a if I'm doing an interview, recording a podcast, how do I like maybe address the diversity problem? Like if I'm speaking to a female brewer, um, you know, how do I how do I sort of spotlight the problem, address it without sort of doing the thing that you said not to do, which is, hey, look at you, you're a woman in brewing. What do you want to talk about? You know, like how do I how do I I don't know, enhance awareness of the problem without doing the things I'm not supposed to do. <laughs> I think you can ask an open-ended question. What's your experience been in the industry? That's it. And if you know she or he wants to respond and talk about their gender or their ethnicity and that experience, and that's, it's, it's a more authentic conversation as opposed to a forced conversation. Okay. I, I would also add there was a something I retweeted a while ago was where this woman um, was being interviewed, she was like a CEO of a major company, and they asked her immediately about, you know, work-life balance, and what's it like to have a family? And she actually said, you know what, I, I respect that, you know, that people want to hear the answer to that, some people want to hear the answer to that question, but until you ask that same question of all the men that you're asking, I'm not going to answer it. And it was something that made me aware of the fact that when we're doing interviews, um, you know, and we have someone that we want to spotlight, we tend to ask them like those really specific questions. But then you're not doing that to everybody that you ask. You're not saying, "Hey, what's it like to be a father of two?" You know, and own a brewery. No, nope. I mean I've never seen that question asked in a brewer interview. Have you? You know, it's if you're if you're going to ask about you know the things that you know that are talking about family or you know relationships you know what's it like to you know start a brewery with your partner or something like that you probably want to make sure that you're doing that both ways because it shouldn't just be about that uh that one side so if i just thought that was such a cool way to answer that thing it's like i, I totally respect it you know some people some people really do want to hear about you know me and my kids but at the same time are you going to ask that of somebody who's not uh you know a woman or someone less represented <laughs> yes. Hey. Have you all? Um, I've heard some references when you talk about age and so forth. But have you done anything specifically looking at people above the 40, 45 demographic? Because I'm, besides being a beer writer, I'm editor of uh, Boomer Magazine, which is baby boomers. And no one in the beer industry wants to advertise with us because baby boomers don't drink beer. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Three thousand dollars. Yeah. Thanks for this question. Um, I was in Phoenix about a week ago, um, showing some um, basic uh, beer drinker data. Um, Phoenix de demographic metropolitan area in comparison to the rest of the nation. And um, that area specifically, um, craft beer drinkers skew very young. Um, and if you think about Arizona, that state does not skew very young. Um, it's a pretty bimodal distribution of by age in Arizona. We have quite a, quite a young population and a quite an old population, or older population. Um, so that, it, it prompted a really, really um, fruitful discussion about, um, oh, you know, it's possible that older craft beer drinkers might not feel perfectly welcome in my tap room because the 20 something crowd has, like, you know, camped out there. And you know, so we, they talked about ways to, um, again, maybe do some partnerships and shifting programming, um, uh, ways to kind of um, maybe market hours so that there's kind of a you know, more open way to think about it, but I think this is a really great question, and it's not one that people think of very quickly or very immediately when they when they hear diversity. Um, but I think it's absolutely important. Um, and you know, there's still a bajillion boomers, right? Like there's still tons of boomers, and that's a really, really um, um, under undercapitalized population. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great, uh, great question, and I think it's uh, really important to do away with the, the assumptions uh, and, again, focus on creating a beer experience that, that's uh, enjoyable for everyone. Um, and um, you know, believe it or not, I'm actually approaching uh, 50. Um, no. I love beer keeps me young. <laughs> beer keeps me young. Uh, but uh, you know, my, my, um, I see my target group is anywhere from, from 21 to 65, or, and um, I don't even have it off there. It's about creating different styles of beer that appeal to different um, generations of people, different types of people. 
Um, so I think doing away with these with the assumptions is a key part of what I do to, to, to uh, focus on everyone. Yeah, um, and just one point of kind of interest about this. Uh, there's some there's some recent research that, that um, entertainment experiences that appeal to older adults um, tend to skew towards the educational. Um, so like I'm, I'm learning something or I'm having a new experience, and this for me this is such a huge opportunity for breweries that are doing tasting flights or different kind of um, educationally centered experiences to, to reach out to them. Yeah, um, just really just a thought as following up on this point. Um, in terms of going to breweries, and it's not just breweries here in terms of the breweries that you're representing, but overall in the country, it's fairly rare that I walk into a tap room and there is somebody that's older than 30 that's serving beer. Um, or it's rare in a, let's say, a white-owned brewery that there would be black servers or yeah, the diversity, just in terms of hiring all raw, seems to be an issue. Is that something that, that you all are looking at as a way of um, making your business uh, more diverse overall? Yes, and uh, <clears throat> not just at Denizens Brewing Company, but also part of the diversity community. We, we created five goals this past year, and one of those goals is to increase diversity and inclusion within our industry in terms of who we're hiring who's working for our companies. And that's not just breweries, but that's up and down the entire chain. So raw material suppliers to wholesalers, to breweries, to retailers, something that we're really looking at. Um, and that's, you know, actually I'll let Dr. J answer it in terms of the efforts we're making, but um, that's one of the topics that she's working on to create materials for people to help us be better at that as an industry. <coughs> Uh, yeah, I think as, as Ben mentioned earlier, this is probably one of the more challenging barriers to access as far as um, if, if you're starting up, but even in just breaking into the industry. And I think those of us who have kind of been around craft beer long enough know that like there's a fairly tight system of social relationships as far as um, building job, building breweries and getting jobs. Like it, it's been a you know industry since the days of apprenticeship. Um, so um, while it could stand to open its doors, um, there's also kind of mirroring on the other side a lot of um, populations who have historically not even considered this industry as somewhere where they could get a job, right? Like, oh, that craft, working craft beer, that's a thing. Uh, so um, some of the things that we're exploring would be, um, you know, membership relationships, thinking about educational internships. Um, thinking about um, providing, um, collecting kind of databases of um, well-trained, hireable folks. Um, my sense from talking to brewers for the last few months is that this is one of the things at the top of their mind when you say diversity and inclusion there. They actually don't automatically think about their drinkers. A lot of brewers automatically think about their employees. Um, and for them, it's not about, I want to go out and hire this particular person. It's really just, how do I increase the pool of good folks, right? And if that pool of good folks happens to also be connected to the community where I'm located, um, that's only going to strengthen my connection with this particular community um, and, and you know, keep people who are rooted here in this space. And uh, we're coming to the end of our time here, so if you got one quick one, yeah. and then we'll kind of wrap up with how, you, how people can uh, kind of contact you guys if they want to continue the conversation. Go ahead, Rachel. I was just curious, um, when you talk about like drawing female clientele and female um, employees, do you ever spend any time thinking about how to retain female employees and create a positive work environment for them, um, especially working in actual brewing itself? I spent a summer as an interim brewer and there were times when I couldn't reach certain things or we went to an event and all the uh, male employees uh, had hotel rooms for the event and it was like, well, you can figure out what you're going to do. So how do you, like, how do you approach um, creating a work environment for women, I guess is what I'm getting at. I'll just uh, um, start on the scene. Um, it, it's um, pretty important. I think it's a, it's, there's a, a chain and egg issue of um, building the pipeline of people, of women, women in brewery, who would think about the fact that they, the, the shells are too high, right? So I think having people there, it's going to take a, a while, but 
have people in the system in the first place will help create the circumstances that people will think about. It, uh, just having a, a more um, diverse group of thinkers uh, apply, <coughs> applying their thoughts to a problem, uh, applying creativity to the problems is, is part of the, the process that's created. And uh, if I can, oh, you want to follow up with that? Yeah, sure. I mean, we also we have a lot of step stools around the brewery. Um, <laughs> no, I think it also, you know, we have a lot of females in leadership position and staff. I mean, obviously, I'm a female. I'm one of the owners. My wife is also one of the owners. Um, and so we have a lot of women who are in charge of things. Um, so that that's helpful. Um, and it's also just creating, I think, an environment where everyone's expected to sort of be equally responsible for things. So, for example. We have rules that when you go to change a keg, everyone's required to use two people to yeah. do it, yeah. right? And so it's not like, you know, the big tough macho guys, like I can lift that keg and I can change it myself. No, the rule is everybody uses two people because it's just good practice. You don't want to get injured, right? So that makes it, I think, more inclusive. That's just one little anecdote. Cool, and if I can have just to be just kind of maybe a last word or just uh, how people can get in touch with you if they want to continue conversations. Uh, about relationships, right? So we've got a lot of great people in this room, and great people on stage that I'm sure that you guys should get to know. Uh, okay, quickly, uh, last word um, for me. Um, when we do diversity and inclusion well, it doesn't equate to special programs for special people. Diversity and inclusion done well improves the experience for everyone, period. Um, easiest way to get in touch is probably Twitter. Um, I'm at J-N-I-K-O-L. B E C K H A M. And if you'd like to talk um, for a story or um, happy to talk to you on the record, contact Abby at the Rosen Group um, and she will um, help you up. Uh, okay, final, final thoughts. The, um, I think the, it's key that um, diversity and inclusion is, is not considered something that is a, a nice thing to do uh, or a charitable thing to do. It's really an imperative, and so the, the mindset. Um, a, a new mindset is coming about uh, where people are realizing that economic growth to grow the craft beer industry requires paying attention to, to this issue. It's not just to be nice. Uh, and, and people, I think craft brewers, uh, need to uh, reach out to become role models um, and mentors for new people coming into the industry. Uh, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have Jim Cook as, as a mentor, if I didn't have that program, I, I would not be sitting here. So I think it's important to uh, emphasize that. Um, you can ask. If they're doing those kinds of things, uh, I think it would be a, a helpful step uh, in the process. Oh, and uh, uh, yep, so um, at Razo Forte Beer uh, is my handle. Uh, just to remember that uh, in Spanish, Razo means arm, and Forte means strong, and my last name is Armstrong. So that's what they're doing with the name. Uh, it's my birthday nickname on a tour to Spain several years ago. Um, uh, and or uh, Bev Armstrong, Bev at RazzaFortetheater.com is my email address. Um, I guess my last word is just thank you guys for wanting to talk about this and write about this, these topics. Um, thank you for your efforts. I don't really have anything else more to say beyond that in terms of the last word. Just thank you and please keep it up. Um, and then if you want to get in touch with me, I do have Twitter, it's <coughs> just at Julie Barati. Um, yeah, you can, I think you can direct message me or you can tweet at me. I'm still, I, I mostly just read Twitter, I don't tweet very often, but. Um. And I want to thank you guys so much for this awesome panel. Everybody please thank you.
Myślę, że będzie lepiej. A może ogłoszą wreszcie, że nie pan już przeczytać trzeba być do goryczkowych filmów. No właśnie, na wcześniejszej, na wcześniejszym panelu Julia Hertz mówiła, że po raz pierwszy w historii e, GAPFA, czyli Great American Festival, American IPA nie jest najliczniej reprezentowaną kategorią, tylko New England. Przy czym ona powiedziała, że oni nie używają nazwy New England, tylko e, Hazy albo Juice. Oni, o, oni bardzo walczą z tym, e, z tym określeniem New England, tak samo jak z Cascadian, Dark Age i tak dalej. Więc raczej bym się tego nie spodziewał. No ale przecież nikt ci nie każe kupić New Englandu, przecież to nie jest tak, że są same New Englandu. Każdy znajdzie coś dla siebie. Chociaż słyszałem ostatnio jakieś narzekanie, jak Tomek Gebel pisał, że sezonów w Polsce, w Polsce się nie bawi. No i ciekawe też było o tym, że 70% wzrost liczby zgłoszeń na PILS. To pokazuje, to pokazuje ten. Zresztą jedno z, wyst z wystąpień następnych będzie o e, degustacji lageru. Więc obok New Englandu to najbardziej taki duży trend to są właśnie kwestie. No i to co mówiła też Julia, chociaż nie rozumiała, że bezalkoholowe. Twoje imię od tyłu to Szamot. Tak, a ry a tak, tak wyglądał pokój po wczorajszej imprezie. No widziałem to właśnie, widziałem, znaczy widziałem tra transmisję, że jak zobaczyłem, że to jest, że to jest, e, przegrywają u siebie z Luksemburgiem, z drużyną z Luksemburga, to już pomyślałem, że niżej upaść nie można. Masakra. Przełączamy się na scenę i jedziemy z Hopsem. No Gibraltar jeszcze jest, nie wiem czy tam jest jakaś drużyna na Gibraltarze.
Nie obrażaj harnasia. Miasto nie, ale, ale mamy jakiś wyjazd na jakąś, na jakiegoś browaru. Tam będzie jedzenie i, 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 i picie. I, if you haven't uh, yet met anybody from the NBWA, you'll, you'll find their booth over there waving at you. Uh, please, please do so. And we, are, we are certainly have appreciated your years of support through this conference because they too have just an incredible wealth of knowledge, data, uh, connections that can help you all with your craft as well. So next, from this, uh, from the National Beer Wholesalers Association, uh, we're very pleased to have with us the Senior Vice President of Industry Affairs, Paul Pisano. Paul leads the NBA, MBWA's efforts uh, in industry, legal, and state governmental affairs, and serves as the liaison to state distributor associations and outside groups. So prior to joining the MBWA, he did work for the U.S. Census Bureau and on Capitol Hill. And we've got a great uh, presentation. Please help us welcome Paul Simon. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I'm a so normally you get Lester Jones, who's really a great guy, a very great presenter, and he's an economist. I had that job before we hired uh, uh, Lester. He does it so much better. So, and I. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Lawyers aren't fun. So that's why I'm wearing a jacket because I'm a lawyer. But I'm also a veteran of hotels and know that these rooms are freezing. So you gotta wear the jacket. But otherwise, you're still free. And you're still going to be in the bathroom. So, especially with security. So, my name is Paul. I work with MBWA. I've been there for 11 years. My job there is to, uh, Julia and I cross paths a lot on the legal and regulatory type of issues as well as industry lays on I'm here to kind of fill up, fill, uh, fill in two things that the previous two panels have already highlighted a lot of the great data and a lot of the opportunities and challenges uh, for the beer industry and uh, to talk about some things that we can uh, talk about here. So, talking about changing alcohol industry, talking about, uh, you know, just a reminder that demographics is best. Uh, this, kind of, this country is changing and the data that I'll show shows some of that. And it's, like, again, it's both opportunity and uh, peril for uh, for the beer industry and have to you know ride that wave properly and then finally try to give some resources for as you're writing your stories out there as as did uh, julia earlier or some you know anything that we can do or some other ideas that are out there that maybe you might not have heard of some suggestions for things to turn to so in terms of uh this is a slide maybe lester showed it before but it's a uh, it's important the beer industry is always changing uh, this is a uh, this is back to 1977. We had a uh, big five or 70 percent. Today, the big five or 81 percent. But back then, there was 44 other small regional guys: your Schaefers, your Rheingolds, your you know, Ballantines, fighting for 30 percent. Now we have over 6,000 people fighting for 19 percent. 
So that is a, welcome to today at Beer World. That is a very, very competitive world. Set uh, your breweries and your, and your and experience is different from everyone else. It's so important in today's marketplace. And that's from 1977. Let's just go back five years. This is a uh, beer industry segment. This is a little day different than uh, the VA data set. This is from Beer Marketers Insight data and how they define craft and imports and like super uh, super premium. That's your um, that's your ultras and blue moons. Uh, <laughs> but you know that's a uh, if you look here, this is a big change just to keep an eye on in the last five years. That's grown from here to here. So craft's obviously grown. Uh, Ultra is on fire out there out in the marketplace. But that's an unwritten story that, that Julia mentioned as well. Craft uh, imports are on fire. Imports are bigger than craft beer and can grow faster than craft beer. And that's something that we need to be always aware of the consumer that's out there and what they're buying. So, uh, this is some data that we've seen before, but again, it's just fascinating to go through. It's just wow, this is amazing stuff. Just, just look at how many breweries just. 1990, 2000, 2010, today. These are permanent birds. Uh, it gets a little technical for you. You say, wait, there's not 9,000 people in the beer. These are 9,482 uh, people have filed paperwork with the TTB as of June of this year, as saying, we fully intend to produce beer and file paperwork. Doesn't mean they're making beer yet. There's a difference. And the PA is very good at tracking folks that. Hey, uh, I'd like to find out about how to open a brewery and get the paperwork started. <laughs> and then get your, get your tanks and get everything else. There is a lag time there. But that's just to tell you that's how many people are growing. And that's, look how much just in just the last 10 years. It's just crazy how much the growth is there. So this is uh, that same data broken down by state. Uh, this is each state. Um, 94,000 permits broken down, and thousand, one out of every nine is in California. Well, some would say, well, one out of eight people are out of California, so that makes, that makes sense. Uh, there's also, uh, I mean, so these are by, by state, you know, each state has difference. This is the same data broken out, the change in the last year, since last, uh, since last year with the Fulton data. And this is, uh, you know, some states, there's an extra 60 in California, extra 28 in Pennsylvania. And in breaking this down by uh, legal drinking age and population percentage, uh, the national average would be 3.92 here at the bottom. And you have some of your crap strongholds, you know, your Colorado, 11.2, Maine, uh, Vermont, Michigan, uh, Michigan, Montana, strong states, other states are on the map. So it's a question of uh, why uh, you know, some states are more, but if you look at this data, this data is closer. Uh, uh, Julia showed this slide earlier, but this is an important slide. This talks about uh, it's not just beer that's growing, that great growth. Look, distilleries growing, wineries still growing. Total permits uh, of, of suppliers at TTB continue to grow just from 10,000 there to 20,000. Double wine spirits wise. There's a lot of people getting into the alcohol business or wanting to get into the alcohol business. And this is a way we broke up the data a little differently. Uh, I talked about, you know, there, it looks like how many, you know, average permits they brew, uh, they issued per day. And you can see uh, for a while it went from 0.6 double and then going, 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 going. And maybe we had a peak last year. Um, we're at, uh, or 2017, 2018, first quarter, 3.5, 3.4. We're looking at that, trying to get a comparable data, like uh, the GDP of the country. 3.4% growth is still pretty darn good. <laughs> We're happy with that. You know, when it's 0%, it's not good. Uh, but, you know, so it's even even the slower growth here is still bigger than right there. So it's, it's still growing very, very strongly, very robust. VA keeps a, a track of brewery openings and closings, record openings, and record closings because there are so many breweries. Oh, I hate this slide. I forgot that. Sorry, I came out. Um, the growth per capita. This shows uh, you know, where the growth is uh, per capita. So that one that showed uh, uh, 
at the earlier show that some, like, hey, how come my state's only 1.4% birds? But if you look, the same states are often growing faster than the other states because they're, they're catching them. Uh, everyone uh, in some states that are very strong craft states uh, may, you know, for example, your West Coast states are not growing, they're still growing, but they're not growing as fast as some of those other ones. And so that's why uh, these states in the green are your guys on, you know, going 100 miles per hour growing, these are 50 and these are 25. But they're still moving. So that's uh, some of the brewery um, framework here. But then, okay, you got all these guys making gallons, making beer. Where are we going to sell? What's our population like? And that's where you know, the demographics is destiny the issue. It's really important for us to kind of always um, keep in mind. And I liked your question earlier about what about you know you know you know experience for just well, for me well, gray hairs and uh, you know not just uh, you know how to get everybody drinking. And this is, so it's the best time for the beer industry and the alcohol industry in regard to the fact that three out of every four people in this country are over 21. Um, that's good news. Uh, bad news is long term, that's a concern because over here, we're going to get fewer drinkers each year. We had that rise of the millennial drinker, and we're, we've come down that, we're, we're, we're coming down. So we're not going to have as many. New 21 year olds jumping into the into the into the fray, and uh, you know there's these are big uh, transition points in people's lives. And we should wrap around the 28 30 time frame and the 16 time frame. That's the uh, selling down uh, time frame, and this is the uh, you know moving to uh, support retirement time frame. So what does the demographics tell us about data? Uh, well, these are some that uh, uh, I know uh, they've talked about in some presentations about who drinks what. And again, these are very broad brush. They never take account of the individual. But this is from Scarborough and NBWA put together some uh, research on this, just trying to find a, a, a and again, it, 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 it supports some of the things we've said uh, for a long time. And, Obviously, older folks are drinking wine, younger folks are drinking uh, craft beer. Yeah, peak craft beer is 25 to 34, and then it seems to be on a, uh, a, a, a path down. Uh, spirits is, uh, is, is down, and you, you're drinking less as you move down, down, the, down the frame, but beer is still strong among young beer, beer, beer is majority until here, and it's still strong, it's just, you know, that's, you can look at it, but we're gonna have more and more people moving into this, into this bracket as this country uh, gets older. Difference between genders uh, on that survey, again, this is a, you know, the scary thing that we talk about, how do we fix, how do we uh, uh, get the, you know, the beer category more, uh, it, it is not a monolith, but, would be very important. Cider is doing a much, much better job than the concept of beer. And so the many, I know many of our uh, breweries are in both, and uh, they're seeing uh, strong support with the, with the cider. So these are, this is two data points that Lester's been talking about, and I think it's important for us to, as we think of ideas and try to understand where this, where this market's going. In all three generations, uh, according to the American, the Bank of West annual millennial study, we think we try to think of millennials as some, you know, space aliens or different than the other generations. But if they're not, I mean, what's their definition of the American dream? Very, very similar to the previous generation. Only them, not having debt, retiring, community, retiring comfortably, not having to worry about a you know, paycheck. And they believe the American dream is still tenable. Then the problem is when some of the wine, uh, some of the wine folks are starting to see, and you might have picked up that some of the, on their, um, the wine sales are starting to suffer as people, their core market, they're not buying as many hundred dollar bottle wines anymore. Now why is that? One of the big things that's going to impact the indulgence market 
is there's more and more people move to fixed incomes. When you retire, you're not, when you retire, you're gonna, you have to be better about your budget because the, and that is something that the, the bankers for the, um, at least for the wine industry, have started to, to preach. Uh, and it's gonna impact potentially uh, breweries, uh, breweries when you get closer to uh, issues such as, am I gonna go to the, ta the tasting room? Or am I going to buy diaper? <laughs> uh, or I don't have a babysitter. I can't go out. Well, I can bring my. I know they're very family friendly, family friendly. Last night was a great example. But that is going to be a bigger issue uh, moving forward. Of, you know, time and money for both generations. Your folks on retirement and your folks in uh, millennials as they start to pursue the, their their dreams. So this is the echo baby boom. This is the folks where they're growing population. And, uh, and the usual suspects and the folks that are declining population. It's very interesting that so many states are declining population but growing craft brewers above the national average. And I think that is catching up with the, some of the states have been more behind in terms of craft beer and at least others have. The uh, drinking age, again, uh, legal drinking age share population at a, kind of an all time high. And that's very going to go back. Um, you know, as we don't have as many young folks coming into the, not as many 20 year olds graduating into the 21 year old LDA because of the demographic shifts of our country. But what's that mean as we kind of get an older population? And so it means things, we have to look at things differently. And this was a great article the Wall Street Journal had. I don't know if you, this is uh, like six months ago, but it, it's, it's a good example. I mean, when we think of like beer distributors serve BFW halls or American Legions or some of those health posts that. Uh, that's the that's the old guy that was in Vietnam wars and they smoke and they drink and they play pool over there. Well, that's changing. You have 20 years of folks coming back from uh, serving in Iraq and, Iraq, and they, they're members. You know, I don't want that dust bill thing. I want something more uh, attractive. So this is the American Legion in Hollywood, which is one of those. It was a very fascinating article how the next generation, uh, similar to uh, you know, reforming American legions. Turning that into, uh, instead of just a, uh, we're going to have, you know, Miller Light or Bud Light on tap and watch a football game. They're turning it into a, a social event for everybody that they want to be in with craft beer and with other, with other alcohol. Access to alcohol is expanding. It's <coughs> amazing where alcohol is being sold these days. Burger King, Bed Bath & Beyond, Nordstrom's, you know, Whole Foods, obviously, barbershops some places, the tap rooms obviously, movie theaters. So think about it. all these things are, all these are new from, uh, all these are new from, uh, you know, from five years ago, 10 years ago, except in you know, the tap rooms get longer in life. But think about, you know, the availability. Of it. There's, a zoo. There's not a zoo in America that's not serving beer anymore. <laughs> and, but that's, that's a change of more access and more availability of alcohol than, than before. And then at the retail landscape, uh, the folks that are the actual traditional grocers, these are a big, big issue on the beer industry. These folks are selling more and more beer, not much craft beer, a lot of private label beer. Uh, and uh, they're at the, they're at a different, they're not really craft friendly yet. And then we, Amazon is gonna be open chapter. We'll have many, many beer bloggers conferences talking about the impact Band on, on the beer industry over the next decade, but uh, you know the, the list of uh, businesses that are uh, concerned about Amazon is pretty much every business is concerned about Amazon. So, with all those new types of retailers, and so the uh, total number of retailers continue to grow. I mean, there's places for to sell beer. Beer is the leading of it. Beer, beer sold at the majority uh, of places. The only places that don't sell beer pretty much are some state liquor stores and some specialty wine shops. Uh, but pretty much beer is in the 600,000. So that's, that's a great <coughs> beer and their availability. And, uh, and, and that's a uh, similar point. But the problem with that, we have all those wonderful places selling beer, but we're just still drinking the same amount of beer. So and I, again, uh, from that first slide showing that 6,000 breweries fighting over the, uh, you know, potentially, you know, 19% of the market, you have all these uh, 
the consumption, all these places that are serving beer, but it's the same amount. So the, the pie gets sliced thinner uh, than previous, previous retail markets. <clears throat> and again, the per capita consumption of alcohol has trended down over the last, um, this gallons per LDA has trended down over the last several years. It's, I think it's stabilizing a little bit, uh, but it's one of those issues that you know, we have more retailers, declining consumption, um, slightly declining consumption. It, it just, it makes it a very, very competitive marketplace out there for, for the brewers, the wholesalers, and the retailers, all trying to get that consumer uh, to, to pick their brand. One aspect of it, and, and this is something that you've, uh, uh, other folks have written about, but it's just the data is pretty uh, strong, and it is, you know, the price of beer has gone up uh, much faster than the price of uh, liquor or, or wine. And that's, uh, and that's just something that, you know, I think is contributing to the general macroeconomic line. Some of the volume of beers down, uh, and draft is a, a subset of that, but I think that might be impacting the, uh, as folks say, well, but otherwise it's going to cost this much, I'm just going to pick up Sierra Nevada, and that's an opportunity for craft beer. Um, and that's uh, something that's, but the wine and spirits folks do not have the same concerns on that issue as us. This is an interesting slide, too. We always talk about, well, everyone's drinking double Imperials. No, they're not. <laughs> the reality is uh, it, it, the, the average weight of the alcohol ABV is, uh, is creeping up, but it's not, uh, it's not, you know, it's not 9%. Not everyone's drinking Bell's or Hard Ale as their only, as their only drink. You know, it's, the reality is there's still a lot of the average, when we talk about averages, it's still around 4.69. And ABV by segment is, you know, perhaps the average is around 5.4. Uh, you know, you got your light beers down here, but uh, you know, it's the, the FMEs uh, are higher, and and the malt liquors, you know, we're all grouped in together, malt liquor and craft. And it's uh, yeah, so it's, it's a there's a spread there. The consumer has their choice of uh, where they want. And again, per capita ethanol, uh, we talked about wine. Uh, I mean, spirits grown, and spirits has gone up from 0.89 from 0.79, and beer has gone from. 1.34 to 1.27 over the last seven years. So, a couple more drinks of bourbon, a couple less beers over the course of a year. Same thing as the total per capita. Um, you know, the peak in 1970 uh, were spirits. You know, this is a this is a lesson for for potentially history. Everyone's saying, "Well, spirits is everywhere. And spirits is kicking beers butt." But go back to the 70s; they're really doing well. The gap was very narrow. There. Gap yeah, here, still pretty. Yeah, it's much bigger than it was back then. So if you look at historical spirits comes up and down, and uh, we, beer is always. A, Julia had a good chart about beer being the drink of preference at Paul from Gallup's been going since 1933, and beer's always been winning that, except for that one year. <laughs> damn that age. Pick that new set. Yeah, damn that age chart. So, uh, uh, but that's uh, it's historically it's kind of a. It's been, it's always been a, um, wine, uh, spirits have been a lot more, sick, and that's uh, beer. We've always been the number one choice, and we need to maintain it that way. <laughs> so, shifting a little bit uh, for, off of the numbers, you know, I'm glad I'm giving a number speech before lunch. Because you have belly full of stuff, and you, you, you can be like, oh, God, more numbers. Uh, but as you try to put together stories, uh, some ideas that you had, probably already using these, but I just throw out there for, uh, for you. One interesting resource, and I start with it, is Mark Brown of Sazer. He's probably one of the more interesting folks in the alcohol industry, if you don't know. He is the president of Buffalo Trace Bourbon, Happy Van Winkle. Uh, email. He wants emails. And he has a daily newsletter of industry. He, he's a, he sleeps like two hours a day, and then he writes this between like 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. It's an aggregator of all alcohol stories across the country. And I think you get it, we'll get some ideas and sending him what you're what you're putting out there, he will he will cover and he will put in there as well. And this goes to everybody. I think his last I talked to him, he's over fifteen thousand. This is the CEO of ABI gets it to uh, you know to the local retailer down the street from the uh, 
uh, distillery. Uh, it is a, and he, he has a lot of interesting stories in there, so it might give you ideas. It also might be an outlet for you to spread your message uh, if you're writing a, a feature article to get it out for him. NAPCA, that's a, they have interesting research. They're the 18 or 17 control states of Virginia at state liquor stores. So they have research, they have, um, they have a daily news column, they, they too aggregate interesting uh, news, so it's a free, uh, that's, that's another free thing is to sign up for the daily news, and look around on their website, because they have research, uh, and, and it's probably a good uh, opportunity, and they would publicize yours uh, as well. Center for Alcohol Policy, that's the Education Foundation for the uh, NBWA, uh, produced research on uh, different aspects of alcohol regulation, and so that sign up for alerts from them as well. And obviously BA, you know about, and the Brewer Association, and Beer Institute, and they're producing, Beer Institute has a, some statistics that come out every month, and BA is great on, you know, twice a day on, on great resources. So obviously you know about uh, the BA stuff. TTB.gov, I really encourage you to sign up for that because, um, as Julia mentioned, and I, you know, one of the issues we can talk about is uh, the issue of, uh, uh, you know, TTB is going to be more active on alcohol regulation, the issue of trade practice, the issues of slotting fees, pay for play, and those type of issues, and how brands get to market. There are 57 active investigations by the TTB on trade practices right now. They are in the final stages. They're going to come out with million dollar fines. Um, they are at a, they're head of trade practice investigations, saying there's going to be a lot of uh, penalties coming out for this. Uh, so that'll, that'll generate a lot of news about the basic issue of like, yeah, how come, how come a health and only has one brand here? You go to your bar, how come it's this way? Um, how do we get, how do we get, how does beer get to market? And uh, TCB is the regulator of the federal level of the trade practice law. So I would uh, encourage you to sign up for there, look at uh, some of the resources on there, and get their alerts on, on their action. Uh, some of the daily beer specific media. I think you know, uh, you know these are some of the, the paid ones are the Harry Shoemaker and Bench Diamonds uh, subscription ones. Beer Business Daily and Beer Marketers Insight. Beer Marketers Insight has a lot of data, a lot of the data that we quoted earlier is from their uh, site. They are around an eight-person operation that crunches a lot of data, and uh, so if you're looking into more data, they're a great source for that. And Brewbound is open. Uh, uh, they're uh, not fee based, so beer. Uh, look at look at that, and then one one plug. I used to work at the Census Bureau. Uh, you know, it's where this whole it's a it's a great place to work because you know, every every newspaper story, every story at the end of the day is a demographic story. So the immigration debate. You look at census data. You look at the changing of America. You look at you know healthcare costs through the roof. Look at the census data. We're getting older. All those things are uh, come from the census, and. Uh, But I had a, um, I gotta get, I got lost in the cut. There's a census, uh, one page of the census that, uh, you know, if you're in economic development, the, the Loudoun County or Prince William folks, uh, they are, uh, the census pretty much does all that stuff for free. So when you, your brewery is, I need to hire some local economic uh, research, that person's just gonna go to this website and they're gonna charge you for it. <laughs> it's a great site for you to look at your local markets and your local areas. Uh, so that I'm a big, big, big fan of the Census Bureau. Uh, make sure you fill in all your forms whenever they, when they mail them and knock on your door. Please, please complete the census. Here's some resources MBWA has. Uh, we're having a delivery local jobs campaign that talks about the economic impact on the beer distribution side of the ledger. And then we also you know, partner some other groups. For example, uh, FinTech. We talk about, uh, you know, we uh, go to FinTech. FinTech is, a, you know, whenever the transaction between a beer distributor and, say, a Walmart or a Buffalo Wild Wings, and Tex, you know, this person sold 18 cases of Budweiser, 17 cases of Yingling, three cases of Bells, and, they, and, and, and they, they aggregate it all. So in here it shows, you know, what's the busiest holiday? So we're off-premise, so we have a listing from them. What's the busiest holiday for off-premise and on-premise? And you know, uh, the Fourth of July at home is often the biggest off-premise. Everyone's having a picnic on the Fourth of July. 
uh, the biggest away from home on premise, St. Patty's Day. Uh, and that's when people leave their houses to go to a bar. Um, you know, on premises uh, is hurting, on premise establishments are down. Overall, uh, alcohol retailers are up, but uh, on premise is trending down. But it's critically important for building brands and for getting people out to experience new beers and to get them into an on premise account. So these are single the miles number two on premise, uh, or Super Bowls number two, single the miles uh, uh, three. And uh, so that's going to be in the package. This is, sorry, this is another uh, publication. Too. This comes out every month. And this is something uh, Lester does as a survey of beer distributors when they order more beer every month. So this next month, I'm going to order more cider, or I'm going to order more cram, I'm going to order less F. And we've been doing this for two years now. We really, really predicted the trend. Uh, you know, crap, crap growth has slowed um, uh, and from the high, from the, the double digits to the single digits. But you know, our, our BPI predicted that before we started seeing it in the newspaper because wholesalers are saying, you know, I'm not ordering as much as I used to. Uh, I'm not selling. It's not selling as well. I need to step, order less. So. This is uh, a, you know, we, we break it out by total. This over 50 means the market is expanding. So it's, it's growing. Um, imports, uh, craft, premium lights, premium regulars, uh, below premiums, FMBs, and cider. Uh, the FMB category is something that you're not underscore how, I mean, it's, this is June. It's probably if we're doing August, it's up here. It's what's happening with the, the white claw and the truly and those seltzers and it's crazy it's a uh, they're selling tons and tons of that out there in the marketplace right now and uh that just and we, the question is is this uh, another uh root beer you know playing and you know i'm not talking about not your father's root beer anymore but that was the hottest thing in the past uh we're not drinking as much as that but it's, it's seltzers here today it's a part of a uh, part of a lifestyle issue um is it Great marketing is it a, a new customer? Are customers that we need to bring into the beer category and we transition from an FMB? They like that. I like to try uh, a special craft. You know, that's going to be our opportunities moving forward. Uh, our website has a lot of great recipes. I encourage you to link to them, or uh, you know, if you're looking for ideas for any of your your stories, please do so. And our, our Instagram page is. Uh, always being active up, updated here. We have two folks from our office in our press shop here, uh, over there, Allison and Sarah. And so please, uh, if you haven't had a chance to talk to them, please please do and uh, want to be able to help you with do your jobs. So another data we have is, uh, item we have is our distributor productivity report for, for folks that uh, do that. And just to give you a little background about the changing nature of our business from the, from the beer distributor side. Back in 2005, you know, we'd have a, you know, maybe we we'd have a, maybe a 3,200 square mile average. The average, this is on average, so there's going to be some huge, some that are going to be, you know, just small, one or two grand only. But on average, you know, we have around 3,200 square miles of bigger territories. You know, but different densities. And this, this is something that changes. And we've seen it have around 196 cases. Uh, SKUs or stocky units, a lot of blood, low light, middle light, stack it high, let it fly. And uh, those days are not here. Uh, we're up to, we've gone from almost less than 200 to average of over 1,000. We have several distributors way over, way over 1,000. The average inventory age back then was 21 days. It's crept up to 27 days. We had 38 routes per week. Now we have 60 days. Miles per week, a little higher. The sales per case, the average price has gone up uh, as the price of gear has moved up, and uh, that we talked about earlier, and as we move towards a craft and imports, it's end up uh, possible. So this is a, uh, you know, again back to the, that challenge we have. Before we had a few beers, but they moved a lot. So we put the beer there, go back to the truck and be gone already. Put it here, come back. Now we have. Uh, you know, it's not, it's, not, it's not as much. It's a, we put it there and sit longer, and we got it put there. It's more of a uh, the, the, the turn, the uh, inventory turn, but we have more products. So it's more 
six pack specific than larger uh, volume units. It's, and that's that's a function of more diversity. Uh, people have more choices than, than they did back there. So that's 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 a good thing. One issue that comes up is what about wholesaling? You know, you know, we talked about we have that chart about we have a 9,000 first chart, 9,000 brewery permits. Well, the, the, the number of wholesale permits is 20,000, and that's growing. And that's growing faster. Uh, every week, the TTB, if you add up to their, get onto their website, there's more alcohol wholesale permits added every week than on a winery or um, distilleries or importers. Breweries don't have to get a permit. The file notice that so that's that's a trade secret. We don't know who the brewers are, <laughs> but every wholesale one, everyone with a federal wholesale permit is publicly available on the TTP website. You can look at their address and their number, and it's all up there on the TTP website. And the number of new wholesaler uh, permits continues to grow, uh, but the, the challenge remains the uh, you know, there's consolidation uh, in the, the number of establishments continues to grow. Um, Wine spirits model is really consolidated. Beer has not had that uh, massive consolidation at this beer distribution level that the wine spirits model has. Um, you know, there's always challenges that it will come to the beer category, uh, but you know, it's it's you know, as of yet, it's not it's apples and oranges compared to the wine and spirits consolidation. Wine and spirits are their top five control. I uh, think distributing like seventy five percent of the market. Top five of the year, or like 11 to 15 percent. So it's it's a different a different animal, different animal. <coughs> but it's something to be mindful. Of. But that being said, where there is consolidation, as I talked about that previous slide about the acreage getting bigger, there is opportunity. There's some great craft beer strippers here in Virginia that are are popping up. Uh, there are many that uh, sell. You know, there's more and more brands that don't sell uh, distributors that don't sell. You know, they're not based in Miller. And, Budweiser and you're just craft only. Uh, the challenge for any beer distributor is that the scale, uh, back to those efficiencies. Uh, this you know, kind of you know, profitable business is one that can cobble together many or several craft breweries. It's just doing one uh, isn't always a recipe for, for success. So uh, trying to find that proper scale is going to be a challenge for our for distributors. And but we're, we're welcome more and more every day to our ranks and we'll craft the craft department. Again, data, if you need some more data on resources, or some of that data comes from a distributor product or report or, or benefit survey. Your purchases did that for our, our work with FinTech to get you know, which dates. So, and this is that FinTech data again, just a different format. Uh, you know, the dog days of summer, <coughs> this is our baseline. Off premise, people were drinking a lot of beer over the dog days of summer, it's above the line. And then uh, during the cold days, they are spike up for the Super Bowl, and then it uh, spikes up for uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, Fourth of July, these on premise, Fourth of July Memorial Day, obviously, are two really important dates for the, and Labor Day for, for beer selling. Wholesalers have those dates and plans marked out long ahead of time, which I've noticed from experience. On premise, again, the same thing. Uh, people tend to stay home uh, in the colder months, come out of hibernation for St. Patrick's Day, and then they, uh, you know, and they come back, uh, you know, you know during this, the beach, can, and obviously this changes, this is national, if you're in a, a beach where you're by, uh, by Dr. Shed, this is a bubble, during uh, June and July, <laughs> everyone's drinking uh, at the beach at the bar center. Another website for you to uh, kind of add to your story uh, ideas is this This is something I run, it's called alcohollawreview.com. So what I do is I just list the different alcohol legal challenges, uh, or specifically constitutional challenges. Uh, obviously, uh, like Walmart suit in Texas over it's, uh, the liquor laws down there, or this person ship uh, serving this, or total wine service to another state. Uh, I'll put up the uh, uh, a little description of it and links to the court files, and so it's something that's you know, if you're looking for ideas or stories or so, feel free to you know just, you know, just sign up for it. You'll get it automatically, not updated. You get an email automatically. Uh, and there is a lot of litigation out there in four different buckets. Uh, 
antitrust, equal protection, First Amendment, and local commerce laws. There's a case right before the Supreme Court right now about Tennessee retailers, about their residency law. That is a, uh, that's a, before the Supreme Court, it was after the side around October 11th. So that's something what I do, keep a, keep a track on that. First Amendment is an issue. We've worked with the Brewers Association on a really important case in California to prevent the First Amendment from blowing up the five houses. So that's something um, uh, that we're, we're doing. How much time do I have? 15. Okay. Um, so that's something that we work very closely with the California Craft Brewers Association and the, uh, and the Brewers Association. And we had a great victory in the Ninth Circuit on behalf of uh, preventing First Amendment being used to blow up the alcohol because we just allow Anna to push to buy all the business everywhere. <laughs> and uh, so it was something that was very important uh, for us to, to win that case. And we partnered very well with the DA on that. We also partnered with the DA on court antitrust matter for the uh, regarding Anna and Bush's merger with SAB Miller. So it's something that you know, the legal stuff keeps me busy. I'm not the economist, I'm the lawyer. Uh, so I know more about that stuff than the, than the, than the economic, economic stuff. And finally, the only uh, homework I'd have for you is get this book. Everyone talks about, like, well, why do we have these laws? Why don't we do it? Read this book. This was written in my, the history of this book was John Rockefeller. He pushed for the AT. He was the biggest, imagine he was the Bill Gates or you know, Jeff Bezos at the time, the richest man in America. And he funded um, the anti saloon League. And alcohol value, you need to get it out, you need to make it illegal. He's funding it. And then after prohibition passed, he's seeing the cops being corrupted. He's seeing, uh, he's seeing people just ignoring the law, but this isn't working. So, front page of the New York Times, he had an op ed saying, uh, I was wrong. I pushed for prohibition, and uh, we, need to, we need to change it. But he didn't just stop there and say, I was wrong, we need to make it legal. Then he funded a study of how, how do, how's alcohol regulated around the world? What, what are the principles we're trying to meet? Uh, so this study came out uh, in 1933 as, as 21st Amendment being passed. And in it has all the principles of alcohol regulation that we see. You read it today and you say, oh my freaking God, this is the exact same debate on um, marijuana. Right? How do we regulate formally prohibited this? How do you drive out the black market? Should taxes be high or low? Who should be selling it? Who should profit from it? Who should be, uh, you know, have we prevented the abuses of the past? Remember the abuses of the past with the saloon, the bar that was selling salted fish, salted meat, pumping his ear, taking all your paycheck. Uh, was, that was, uh, how do we prevent that from happening again? So please read this book. It's available on the Center for Alcohol Policy website. The Amazon does too. And it's something that I encourage you to uh, read it. It's, uh, really fascinating historical document that explains as you read that today say oh that's why we have this laws. you read it here it's not Paul Pizano's idea <laughs> some guy in 1933 uh, here um, so it's uh, one of those things I really encourage you to read that I think it's a uh, I think you get a bunch of story ideas out of it uh, and it's a it's a, just a fascinating historical read that anyone involved in the alcohol industry should should know that it's just origin so much of the alcohol regulation that we have in our country. So I wanted to leave some time so we can either eat early or we could uh, uh, ask some questions. Um, you know, this is uh, my contact uh, for anything. Uh, I think this material is available, the slides are available afterwards for all presenters. So um, I know there's a lot of data on these slides. You can't write it all down that fast or take a picture that fast. So you'll get this data afterwards. So Hey Paul, uh, totally appreciate the data. Um, and glad that NBWA is always a part of this. I love to see the stats. It's, it's very neat for us to kind of get to catch up of how things are going. Um, I, I noticed something, maybe I maybe I missed it, but uh, I mean, you mentioned all the challenges that are out there, and even the out there with like the, the data and whatnot. But how how is kind of the data skewed right now with um, I guess the, maybe one of the industry terms like loan. So the beer that's not sold through the traditional channels that have happened uh, within the past, and how does that kind of affect 
the overall industry of like where own premise may actually like some like restaurants or stores can close in relationship to that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a challenge. I think uh, you know, we have. You know, I think Bart this last week said ten percent or eleven percent of the beers on premise, uh, craft beers consumed on premise, and uh, and you know, the, the, the challenge holds out that it varies from state to state. I always have that that disclaimer. I'm just going to give a national theoretical concern, but you know, the concern is you know, from wholesaler partners who hear from our retail partners that you know. Guys are taking my customers down, walking out with $20 in their, in their pocket, and they're going to the tap room, they're not going to the bar, and, you know, and then and we don't sell the tap room until the bar, so it's the retailer and the wholesaler not having that sale. So that's a concern from an economic perspective. Uh, what did Mass Julia talk about in her presentation? Well, the bar's got to do a better job of getting traffic into their, to their operation, and, 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 and that's not as much of a concern. But I think the uh, some of the concerns that we would have is, uh, you know, often what we say we kind of, you know, what happens for one can happen for other. You know, when Anheuser Busch bought those ten breweries, you know, they're the fastest growing group of the country. Uh, they're opening up their breweries now. Go to go to Merrimack, New Hampshire, you know, and the Red Festival, ten thousand people. That's more than any of these. <laughs> any of, uh, you know, for whatever what opens for one opens for the others, and that uh, that has a. Uh, that's a growing uh, concern, especially when, I, but I think every state has tap room or tasting privilege uh, opportunities. I think, you know, the prison wholesaler is trying to undo that. That's, the, the concern is always the expansion, uh, you know, and, and when, with our retail partners, especially in some markets, you know, where I was selling craft beer for 20 years and they put a satellite tasting room right across the street from me. They're taking my customer, they're not growing the ground. I was the first one to carry the <laughs> You know, that's by that anger, we're, we're, the, we're the intermediary between, you know, brewer we sell and the retail customer we have. So it's a, it has to be handled, you know, there's no one right answer to it. Just both sides have an argument that, you know, they have good balance on each side. So I'm, I'm not, but I think uh, the challenge also is uh, on the data is, you know, beer is so fragmented on data. Liquor has an advantage on data because, uh, 40% of it goes to the state stores, and they have a centralized database. So you can find out how much Jack Daniels is sold in Leesburg, Virginia at 5 o'clock, like that. There's no way you can do that from here. Uh, it's, the databases are separate. There's 600,000 different people, mom and pops. And you know when it goes to tap rooms, it's not scanned. It goes through the mom and pop, it's not scanned. It's not IRI type data. So the data on beer is really a scattershot. Uh, so the impact is, is, is concerned. And I suppose just announced last week they're starting an own premises division, which you know they say it's not for America, but that's from a wholesale perspective. We're you know an own premise of Anheuser Bush or Miller Coors is a concern for us, and uh, we just you know we're kind of always keeping our eyes open. And, you know, so I'm dancing. I'm not giving you a really straight question. Answer to your question. I don't think there's a it's a, something we're watching. It's hard to quantify. Is kind of the best way to answer that. Um, I, we were just talking about this yesterday. So you you very clearly outlined a lot of the challenges that we have demographically and you know economically, and um, lots of data was presented. And, and one of the questions I always have is, um, I think a lot of the onus is going to come down on the middle tier in the next five to ten years in terms of the economic impact of the fragmentation of the industry, of the way it's growing right now, of the demographics set you know that's coming through. What are some of the programs, or where you know, where is that conversation happening? That's saying, here's a few solutions that the wholesalers are going to provide to try to find new drinkers, which is essentially what needs to happen, right? Because yeah. if we keep fragmenting the pie, it's just going to continue to slow down for everybody, right? So, do you know that? Is that something that you have some insight on, or is there somewhere we can find that information? Because I'm very interested in seeing that. Can you summarize and repeat that question for anybody? Who might have heard it? <laughs> 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 Uh, the question what, what type of programs wholesalers have for, you know, with the challenge of the data that's out there, how do we, how do we localize uh, solutions for... Uh, I guess, how do you find new drinkers? So what are, what are wholesalers doing to help build and find new beer drinkers out there? That's yeah. a really simple way of saying it. Well, one, one you know, how do we you know, know your markets and how do you know, and that, I wish I had that census slide up there. I think we're drawing it to our folks and make sure you know your markets. I mean, 
there's some of these markets are changing. Leesburg's a great example. The distributors here in Leesburg, this 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 uh, or Latin, Latin County, this county has changed so much in the last five, ten years, uh, compared to my first time here in 25 years ago. Uh, you know, it was just like came out for horse races you know, in the fields and that was it. But uh, uh, knowing the market, knowing your, your people and hiring appropriately, I mean, and that's uh, and that's always a challenge with uh, uh, folks trying to, so better better recruiting and uh, better data. That's what we're trying to really, you know, stress the, the census data we're really driving into the our members to make sure they know the market and you know, don't have the excuse, well the market's this way. Your market was that way ten years ago. It's not that way. And uh, and it's part of the you know research we have with our with our retailers uh, what to get. I mean knowing the market is, is, is critical. For example, like talking to the guys in Manhattan. You know, they do an annual survey of taps. For the first time in, in their memory, the number of taps in New York City is going to be less than the year before. Uh, that's that's a concern for New York City because you know they're like everyone seems to have all these brands, but there's more taps to get space. And it's a uh, you know knowing the knowing that and knowing the um, uh, you know just trying to figure out a way to uh, you know you know at the end of the day we're trying to figure out what customers need and how to provide them with information. One of our challenges is, uh, especially if I'm to speak for a, the anonymous distributor that has you know, 30 brands, everyone telling them, you got to do this, 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 and trying to clutter through and figuring out what best, you know, respect the ideas from the suppliers, but at the end of the day, be, uh, be you know, stand up for what you know is going to sell in the market and what your market needs. And that's, uh, but, you know, working with the uh, Resources of our brewers, work with the retailer, and some of the stuff that uh, are data driven. Knowing your data is really kind of the, if I had to give it one answer, it's the data aspect drilling down into the, the data of your market map. Time for lunch. Well, I'll be around for the rest of the day and tomorrow, so if anyone has any questions, please. Follow up with me. And this deck will be available. I know there's a lot of data on there, so you're not going to be able to write that. But whenever they send out the following follow-up emails, you'll get the data. And please, please feel free to talk to me at any point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, all right. Uh, I want to do something really quick. Um, Raise your hand if this is your first Beer Bloggers and Writers Conference. Okay, wow, that's great. That's cool. actually that's a lot more than I thought. Welcome. <laughs> okay, raise your hand if you've been to two uh, Beer Bloggers and Writers Conferences. Great. Uh, keep it up if you've been to three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Yeah, right on. There's the three. Alumni over there. Um, these are the perhaps well, they may think they're the wisest people in the room. You should talk to them. Uh, thanks, you guys, for coming to all these conferences. Um, who's tweeted already ten times using the BBC18 hashtag? All right, awesome. Thank you. Um, who here has been receiving <laughs> texts from us? What do you think? Is it annoying or you like it? It's good. Okay, great. And if you want to receive these texts that everybody else is liking so much, you can text BBC18 to 33222. Can you text us a beer? Uh, <laughs> we're working on that. We're working on that. Uh, there are power ships in the back of the room if you need to charge something. Uh, we will share all the speaker decks. Um, I'm going to say within 48 hours of the final day of the conference. Um, and we have already, in fact, we just shared uh, contact information for all of our speakers and sponsors on the Facebook alumni page. Everybody a member of the Facebook alumni page? So raise your hands if you are. Yeah, well, get on there. It's a really cool spot. Um, okay, here's the plan for the rest of the day. The buses are going to leave for Vanished Brewing at 535 sharp. Why? Because it's the peak of the rush hour, which is about traffic. <laughs> so we want to get out there sharp, right, at 535. We have an expo uh, in this room from 335 to 535. We'll have a chance to get to know our, brewer, our uh, sponsors um, and taste some of the beers from the brewers uh, that are here. Sponsors that want to go um, to Vanish tonight, and everyone's welcome to join us, can break down their booths at 515. And again, we're leaving at 535. So 
And if I were you, I'd go to the expo, drink some beer, have a great time, and then at 5.15, head up to my room and get ready for the evening, whatever that entails. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, but before all that fun, uh, we have a session from Devil's Backbone uh, that'll end at 3.35. And before that, we have a keynote from Sam from Dogfish Head. And no one wants to miss that. Uh, but before that, we have lunch. And we have a few different lunch options. Um, you can buy beer in the restaurant and uh, have a buffet. It's a salad buffet and a lunch, and that's $10. Um, or you can go out back. We have a couple food trucks that came uh, to our event, one called Coyote Grill, um, and they do Tex-Mex, including tacos and mini chimneys, and the other one's Dave's Dogs, uh, and they're just out back. You go out the door here, take a left, take another left, and you'll see the food, two food trucks. <laughs> um, so maybe go to that and then go into the bar and have a beer, um, and that's how that will work. Um, yeah, and this is also a great time to spend some time doing some blog posts and tweets and Facebook posts and all that. So. Thanks a lot for a great morning. We'll see you for Sam's keynote.